In only one podcast on the internet can you be blinded by gleaming white thighs and also smell the farts through the actual audio recording. And that podcast is known as Trapped Under Plastic. The podcast that helps you work through your Dorito-related trauma. Is, what is that a reference to? Um, I think that was in reference to oh. your your break <laughs> from Doritos from a little bit of Dorito overdose. Yeah, dude. Oh, got a little sick with some Doritos. Down with the sickness. That's a good transition to my first topic <laughs> of the preamble ramble. Okay, so back when Flamin' Hot Cheetos first came out, I was all about the Fleetos. Mm. And I was just... <laughs> I've never heard the Fleeto term. Um, I don't think it is one. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> So I was like, I loved them, whatever. Um, but then I haven't had them again. Scott's wh- whipping out that white white balance card. <laughs> we forgot to do our job a little bit. Honey and cock. Did we even sync clap? I did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so <laughs> we're, we're fucking recording. And I haven't had Fleetos in like twenty years. And my daughter is on this like uh, hot food kick, like spicy foods. And we're in the grocery store the other day, and she's like, "Oh yeah, our kids at school have those." Flaming Hot uh, Cheetos, and I was like, I don't think you can handle those. She's, she's like, I've had them; they're fine. I'm like, fine, we're having, <laughs> wow. a, we're gonna get a bag. So she and I uh, sat and ate like a half a bag of family size <laughs> Fleetos the other night. And we we're just hanging out watching TV, and uh, the next morning, GG, not nah, uh, something happened to me. Yeah, it it was did you like turn, did you turn into a Flaming Hot Cheeto. I think my butthole is flaming hot. <laughs> It was warm. It was so sore. (laughs) Raw. Dude, I learned uh, don't eat like three pounds of Flamin' Hot Cheetos in one sitting. Yeah, I Um, didn't know you had to learn that, but uh, yeah. I, you know, sometimes when I eat really spicy stuff, I get like really spicy hot wings or I get like the really spicy ramen. Mm. The next morning I'm a little bit like, Oh yeah, that's what I ate yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> a little not, reminder, but it's it's not ever been this bad. I don't know. If there's some chemical makeup that 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 red dye number five that's oh, in those things. Yeah, dude, it just tears apart your insides. Yeah, so uh, I might t- need to take my version of a Dorito break, which is another twenty years off of Fleetos. <laughs> but they're so fucking good. Yeah, dude, I'm kind of on that Cool Ranch, uh, flaming hot kick right now with Doritos. I haven't had those yet. They're, uh, I mean, I feel like. I feel like all flame and hot products are very similar. They mm. kind of just like kick you in the face with instant heat, but it like tapers off super fast. Yeah, and it's like tangy, you know. So it, and it kind of fits right in with the whole cool ranch, like kind of ranchy thing. Anyways, it's so. kind of like smelling salts in that way. It kind of is. Oh my god, it's the food version of smelling salts. If that's a selling point to you at all, I have. That. Do you want to eat ammonia? <laughs> You know what cat piss smells like? <laughs> Imagine eating it. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. Uh, I have the smelling salts in my bag over here, but what I think. What the fuck? Why? Because I just never took them oh, out. Okay, okay. You're They're just kind of carrying them around. You're hooked now. I think by about sometime in June or July, we'll hit it again after like I get a little bit more confident. We're not just going to cough. Okay, yeah, yeah. Cause I still like my my. You cough, have a cough still? Mine's like almost like a hundred percent gone. Yeah, yeah. Mine's like ninety eight point five percent gone. Okay, yeah. But I don't want to risk. It. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I Maybe mean, we do at the end of the episode. <laughs> Not at the beginning. <laughs> um, I, I, I a couple more quick things. I watched I watched two movies recently. I went to see C- oh. I went to see Sisu in the theater. In the theater, okay. In the theater, it's fucking badass. Nice. So goddamn good. You need to watch that movie. Okay. And then last night I watched I'll all. My watch list. Uh, I watched All Quiet on the Western Front. The the which which one? I think there's the two one. or three. The new one. Okay. That's I th- believe it's in German, but it's um dubbed, um for America. I didn't realize that, but it's pretty good um dub job, but. Man, that movie is so fucking heavy. I forgot it is, yeah. how much the Great War, as it was called before there was a Second World War, I forgot how much that war was the last true barbaric war. Oh, well, um, I think all wars are pretty barbaric. What do you mean? Um, I mean trench warfare and being in, and how people fought and died was so close and so personal probably yeah. for the the last time not that it ever is not that i'm an expert or anything but yeah. that war was particularly um just heinous and cruel and that movie captures it so well it's pretty fucking haunting yeah yeah i think yeah humans have gotten more efficient at killing each other over the years we've gone from the revolutionary war we where we stand in a line and shoot <laughs> each other 
to dude, uh, remember in the Patriot. You ever seen the Patriot with Mel yes, Gibson, dude? Yes. When they're standing in line and they shoot the fucking cannons and a cannonball fucking bounces, goes bounce, takes, takes some dude's like leg out, something dude, like that. Just takes his leg clean off yeah. and he's just standing there and with one leg for like a half second and then he goes. Yeah, dude, that movie's fucking brutal. God, I love that fucking movie, though. Yeah, Civil War also um, is also very brutal. Yeah. In that same, uh, like that movie. It's like um, a, as uh, civ- uh, humanity has evolved, we've impersonalized the way we kill people in war. Yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. If you can remove yourself from it, mm-hmm. then you can do it better, I suppose. Like, I don't know. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It, there's less less chance of something maybe going haywire, but it is the lives on the line, so I guess that's something that's always going to go haywire. Yeah. Um, that's wild. That's wild. Yeah, so those are the movies I watch. I, I, I always get jealous when you talk about movies. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a preamble ramble topic in here called The Long Walk. Okay. Um, so I was working on Sunday, and it was like 7 a.m., and I, w- I went outside to prime this uh, plinth. Um, that's in front of us right here, or to our, to our side. Um, and the, pr- the freaking, all my aerosol cans suck. Uh, yes. Like they all, I think, I, I think when you use an aerosol can, you need to clean the tip out with like mineral spirits or something. Because like all of mine like sputter and are like terrible. Do you, okay, when you use it, do you then turn it upside down? And spray until it sprays clear. I do not do that. I that's what you're supposed to do. Okay. Even for like whenever you use it for like house purposes and shit. Yeah, you always do that because then it, it it obviously all the paint goes to the bottom, the cans upside down, and then to all the air pushes the propellant pushes pushes just, it all through okay. until it's until it goes shoots clear and then you're good. That said, I forget to do it about half the time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they all kind of suck. And so I, I went outside to prime, it didn't even work, and I was like, freaking A. I had my mask on for some reason, like my respirator. Um, so I went back to the uh, office, and the door was locked. Oh, no. <laughs> you got your mini and your spray can. I have my mini and my fucking, not the mini, just the plinth. Luckily, it was just the plinth, not the Is mini. Is your fucking phone in here, too? Uh, my phone and my keys were in here. <laughs> and it's 7 a.m. on a Sunday. Nothing is open. Like, no one is around. I, <laughs> I... I walked my ass home, bro. <laughs> you walked home. I like first walked around the building, opening every single door, knocking on windows, just in case some yeah, other yeah. degenerate is here at the same time. No one else was. I found a lady who was taking a smoke break outside of an apartment building on Raymond, which is like a street really close. And I asked her to use her phone. I called Amber. She was still asleep. I'm just like, fuck, bro. And so I had a very long and somber walk home Man. with my fucking spray can and my mini. And I had I had my hitchhiker thumb out when any whenever anyone drove by me. I was just like, whatever, dude. I don't fucking care if you drive me like a little bit. I don't, it, that that saves me time. But not, no one stopped, and that, I don't blame them. I wouldn't stop either. I would stop. Like, I'm, I got a mask on and I'm carrying a can and a with weird object that looks like a grenade, maybe. Yeah. yeah. So I walked home. It was about a 45 minute walk home. It wasn't too bad. Oh, yeah. 45 is. Yeah. I mean, still, it's pretty close. Amber still asleep when you got home. No, she was like, "What are you doing? <laughs> like, why are you here?" And I was like, I told her the story, and then she drove me back to the office. So, like, check your phone. Yeah. Yeah. I was the question is my my first question was do you have your wife's phone number memorized? Yes, I do. Because like I do, I have mine as well, but like every time I need it, I'm scared there's this moment of like, oh shit. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> What is it? That's like the same thing with me and my anniversary, or like, oh, yeah, or like, yeah, yeah. Or like my wife's birthday. It's like, <sighs> and then I like remember it. Twenty like, twenty third, twenty fifth. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Oh god damn it. Um. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's that's that sucks. Yeah, that sucked. But uh, it was okay. You know, it could have been worse. Yeah. Like people have used the expression like you clear your mind. Like I didn't think about anything while I was walking. I was just like, I don't know. I had like the blankest like brain and i was just like like on a fucking mission to get just back going. to my house i was like fucking like hustling i was like i like ran like every once in a while to like wow. to speed it up i was just like i really wanted to get back uh because i was just so it's the kind it was the same feeling when i sprayed resin all over my fingers i was like 
I'm fucked. It doesn't matter. I have to deal with it now. Yeah. And so I just, or like, I have to move on. Uh, and so moving on was apparently walking home to Roseville. Dude, in those 45 minutes, you could have fixed all the problems in Age of Sigma. <laughs> <laughs> you could have just thought them through. It's just like this whole this whole idea. There are no problems in Age of Sigma, bro. The game was the fucking best. I, did, I think that, like, ever since we did that on the car ride home, I think it's more of like a, a euphemism for something. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, it's just, you know, when you think about it, it's, you know, it's just like, well, what do you, you know, what's what's important in life? It's like, you just, you just sometimes you just got to fix the problems in Age of Sigma. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, if it wasn't a euphemism, it is now. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, there's um, uh, two other things I have. So I want to talk a little bit about Golden Demon uh, at the Warhammer Fest here. There is a lot to talk about with Warhammer Fest. Apparently there was like a lot of... Annoying things that went down. I'm yeah. not sure if you heard about that. I, I think I've heard some. You probably have heard some. Yeah. And in, in, I wanted to ping pong that. But before we get to the the negatory on that, I wanted to have uh, a couple of positive things about yes. Warhammer Fest in the UK 2023. And there was another one I just found out about this morning. Um, but the first thing is there's the category known as the open category in uh, Golden Demon. And that's the one where like staff can can uh, enter and you can do all your own like custom sculpts and stuff and things don't have to be to the same scale as Warhammer models and all sorts of wild stuff in there. That category, you you don't actually win a golden demon. You get you win these plaques, mm -hmm. which are also cool. But I think we can officially at this point rename the open category uh, for golden demon to the goody PP plaque. Okay. Okay. Officially, I it's think. officially known as the Goody PP plaque. So if you win in the open category from now until the end of time in a Golden Demon, <laughs> you will be awarded a Golden, uh, a Golden, a Golden <laughs> PP, <laughs> the Goody PP plaque. And I say that because the last two years at Warhammer Fest, Golden Demon, two Goody PPs have won. Just happen to be the same two people. Then whatever. Whatever. <laughs> so last year, first place was Goody PP Tom Hughes, and third place was Goody PP Darren Latham. And this year, it was second place Darren Latham and third place Tom Hughes. Mm. So we have infiltrated. The Goody PP nation is vast and powerful at yeah. this point. Yeah, the network, we have many spies. Dude, we're just like... In The Last of Us, we're the mycelium underneath the ground mm. that is that is slowly undulating its way through, and uh -huh. it's going to spread to every motherfucking category mm -hmm. and every motherfucking competition. Dude, mycelium is crazy, bro. Dude, mycelium is... It's way smarter than us. Dude, it's like also vast and like it's like how the trees communicate. Yeah, dude. It it's like a brain network. Yeah. For the world. Fuck it, the world is a giant brain. Yeah, it is. And we think we're the smart ones. And trees are hair. Yeah. Oh my god. And mountains are boobies. I was, <laughs> I was gonna say boobies. <laughs> I was like, butts, boobies? Like they're just like general, like whatever features. Yeah, I think like volcanoes are the butthole. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Why did you pronounce it like that? But holes. <laughs> um, I mean, we really could get deep into we this. We could, yeah. Like, we could keep going on this. What a rivers. I kind of want to. All right, the last good, the last good thing I want to talk about: Warhammer Fest, Golden Demon. The last good thing. Yeah, the everything last else from here, it's shit. <laughs> uh, so over at the the Trapped Under Plastic Facebook group. We have been inundated with people sharing their pictures of their submissions, their finalist pins, nice. their their awards, or their commended cards, all that stuff. And I just freaking love that. So mm. um, anytime there's a, a piece that you enter for a competition, it's great to share that out. You have put so much into it and don't ever feel bad about like sharing your pride or sharing what you, if you got a finalist pin and that kind of stuff, share that. If if nowhere else, please share that in the Trapped Under Plastic Facebook group. I see all of those and, you know, it's it's inspiration for all of us goody peepees that, uh, you know, if you want to commit yourself to that, um, good things will happen. Yeah. Also, congratulations to anyone that entered and anyone that took a yeah, finalist pin away. That's freaking awesome, guys. Yeah. 
or I didn't fucking get one. I put two pieces. In. I didn't get a single one. So you're better than me now, apparently. Yeah. Well, I think was is they they got the new shipment in from China of the little pins <laughs> for Warhammer Fest because now they're back to giving out the the correct ratio as opposed to like super stingy Adepticon version where they just like opened the box and they realized there was like 14 pins in there and they're like fuck <laughs> so nobody got them. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Um, oh. One other good thing we found out this morning that they are actually on the Warhammer community page showing pictures of all the commended entries. Oh, yes. What the fuck? I would love to know why that decision was made, but that is such a positive step in the right direction. Good job, GW, 100%. Yeah, we appreciate that. Big time. And we like to think <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, the true soldiers out there screaming for it. Um, the Vince Venturellas of the world. Um, they talked about it on the Artist Opus podcast. Not Artist Opus. Cult of Paint podcast. The culture of Paint. The Culture of Paint. They talk about it. A lot of people talk about it. Obviously, we talk about it here. Um, and maybe that's a sign. Maybe it's little things, little little twinges of the needle moving of, of if we, you know, can kick the dead dog enough times, the babies inside will pop out. Yeah. And they'll be alive. We'll roll with that. <laughs> we'll roll with that fucking. All right, what else you got to say? What else you got to say? I have so many things to say. I played a game at Age of Sigmar yesterday at 1750 points with the Ooh. new Soul Black Grave Lord book. Uh, what are you playing? You playing Legion of Blood or I what? Legion of Blood, man. Yeah, dude. Might as well, you got you got to go OP, baby. Bro, that fucking zombie dragon is insane. Just Velazda up the b hole, dude. I mean, okay. Unmodifiable armor save. Yeah, three non-modifiable. Three up armor save uh, yep. is the key word there. Yeah. Not yeah, okay. Can't improve it, but also can't reduce it, which is fine. That's fine. Does uh, not fucking matter. Does not matter. Yeah, because motherfucker's got fourteen wounds, and he also heals back every single wound he deals in damage. Yep. Okay. He's got a heroic action that prevents people from getting ward saves, yep. which is amazing against Magikin and Nurgle. Oh. It also works on the breath attack. Oh. It works on every attack. <laughs> He's bloodthirsty, and so he gets plus one attack profile on every profile. Oh. Uh, he picks doomed minions, uh, at least with the, the trait I took. Like, they're so obvious. The, the traits and the artifacts you want are so obvious. Um, the doomed minion trait allows you to pick D3 units at the beginning of the turn, and then everything in your army hits that doomed minion, that unit you picked. It can't be a monster or a hero. On a two-up. It's not plus one to hit. It's hit on a two-up. So sounds like we're bringing hordes of zombies at these motherfuckers. You just be like, yeah, absolutely. That that is definitely a strategy as well. Like uh, I gave him flaming flaming weapon. He got a charge. Whatever he charged died in one combat. His death lance did four damage. Yeah, it is with, a death lance with four attacks, hitting on twos, wounding on threes because of doom minions and shit. And he didn't get ward saves and he didn't get armor saves because minus three rend and dude that guy was just killing everything did you run Neffy too I did oh, dude, <laughs> she's Neff fucking nasty too Neffy is fucking redonkulous she is and she also benefits from the the legion of blood thing where she's plus one to uh, attack profiles and plus one to casting when she's not within three inches of someone and twilight allure I gave her waste away and so waste away plus twilight allure she's getting enough every single turn like whenever I was near someone I was like, they were minus one uh, to wound, uh, minus one to hit. They were minus one damage profile if they had more than one damage profile. And she was just, she was a menace. And then also, I, I intentionally kept all of my summonable units around her and my grave sites. And so <clears throat> every single unit was healing three wounds plus one for the gravesite marker every single turn. Mm -hmm. And skeletons are fucking crazy now too. Skeletons, at the beginning of the turn, you roll a d6 for every single model that's dead in that unit. Um, and on a four up, they come back and like, yeah, <laughs> yeah they're very much the they're arm. Crazy. They're crazy. The whole army right now is like you, you can't leave anything on the table by the end of your combat phase. Uh, but by that, I mean, you can't leave a vampire alive and you can't leave any of the units of the summonable alive Yeah, because they'll just come back. They, and they did like, um, he, uh, the only thing that died in my army was a, a single unit of blood knights because, I uh, I had the opportunity to take double turn on turn three, turn two, and I did not take it. And I was like, okay, this unit's going to get charged by these beasts of Nurgle, and they're probably not going to get out of combat ever. And they did it, and they slowly died. But then I got the double turn opportunity in turn three, and I just 
just wasted. Took it then. I just wasted him. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was an uphill battle for poor John for the rest of the the, the game. So I, I pulled out a a cool victory for the Legion of Blood. But holy fuck, I was not playing efficiently, and I still won. Like pretty pretty handily um so that is a testament to how powerful that army is a very punchy punchy army very Dude. Blood, blood knights blood knights pulled some weight but goddamn that vampire and neferata were amazing yeah the only thing that's stinky poo poo <laughs> for you you is that uh i blood knights are not good enough anymore <laughs> they're not good enough and i know you mentioned the thing about like whoop de doo you have to kill a monster um, to get, like, buffs. But it's still nice because it's against Beasts of Nurgle, against units of dragons. Like, if I kill a single dragon with... Uh, see, the, the thing is, that's only if they're cast ally, right? Yeah. I don't get that in Legion of Blood. So, yeah. yeah. That's the stinky thing is, like, cast ally get, is, like, the big thing cast ally gives you is that stuff. Mm. But it doesn't really give you anything else. And so these other factions give you other things. And, yes, Blood Knights are still solid, but... I, I think they're overpriced right now because they're not they're really good jackknife, right? They can do a little bit of everything quite well. Yeah. Um, but they're they're a little too expensive for not being great at any one thing. Yeah. And I honestly think fucking black knights are gonna be hot, Dude, hot now. Black knights, yeah, they seem with their charging mechanic seems super fucking good. Um, I want to kit bash some of those because I don't like the old Black Knight models. Yeah, back in the day when uh, Black Knight models also sucked when they were pewter, and so everyone kit bashed them. And the way that I kit bashed them was I bought a bunch of Bretonian knights and left their heads off and gave them classic Dracula vampire capes. So like they were all headless horsemen, which like oh. which like fucking twelve year old Scott was so fucking into. <laughs> like headless horsemen is where it's at. Yeah. Anyone have a pumpkin on his book there? <laughs> oh, they're coming out with those new Bretonian knights. That might be a sweet starter point kit for some sweet ass black knights. Give them like a like a zombie head too. Like kind of like kind of tatter some of their like fabrics. Yeah, that'd be fucking sick, dude. All right. Yeah, maybe we should do a we should do a kit bash off. Be fun. I know. I I've been a while since I came back. My blood nights. So I'm I'm fiending. You feeling back to it? I uh, absolutely back yeah. up for it. All right. All right. Um, but we could maybe not touch too much on the the negatory of of what we heard from Warhammer Fest. We weren't there. The things that I heard was it was just it was Q Fest because Q is what they call standing in lines. Yeah. yeah. In, I mean, in in the UK, queuing up. Yeah. Queue. It, so it was like you'd stand in line for fucking ever. To just like do a super slap together run through of tenth edition playthrough, or to even like go around the case, that is one thing that's like I couldn't handle is standing in line to look at all the the, the pieces in the case because it's not open twenty four hours like Adepticon, where there's always a line in Adepticon at the display cases for Golden Demon, but that's just why you go there at two in the morning, man. There's never a line. <laughs> right? I don't know if people were allowed to do that. No, um, they, no, they can't there because they close at like seven o'clock. Oh god! Fucking <laughs> what? Yeah, because the whole fucking place closes down at like seven o'clock there. I, I think they closed early so that the content creators could like do something special for like an hour or like whatever it was. I mean, if you went, I because I'm not for certain, but I know that it's like this uh, proper boring ass convention thing where it's just like open seven to seven or something that's i'm almost positive okay okay but like when it closed for the night like if it closed at seven the content creator thing then they kept it open just for them at seven when it would have been fully closed anyway so no one else was there so they just like kept it open an extra hour just for the beautiful people yeah that's nice um i heard things like they had literally one game table per game to demo so necromunda warcry all had one table and so like it was just like impossible to play a game yeah. i heard other things like um was this this person who messaged me said that um like the <laughs> The boxes for like product were just like cardboard boxes with like handwritten descriptions on them, like without like normal packaging and stuff. Um, ob obviously, we weren't there. Yeah, he said the shop queue went around the venue, nothing had prices on it. All the items were in cardboard boxes with handwritten descriptions on them. Um, <laughs> okay, so like we those were, white boxes that they maybe, have at the source. Yeah, they, maybe they, they do write it in hand it, there. Yeah, maybe uh, we weren't we weren't there, so we can't verify any of this information. But yeah, it sounds like it sounds like. 
uh, while Golden Demon was an amazing event, they just didn't really like think about like the logistics, which is a little bit strange when you consider that they know how many tickets are being sold, and mm-hmm. so they can just kind of they can kind of plan it out. Um, but uh, but yeah, maybe some maybe some growing pains there at GW for how to run a convention. It seemed like they were in a new space this time, right? It wasn't Warhammer World; it was in different. I think they've been at this one before, though. Oh, have they? Okay. Before COVID. All right. Then I don't know. So they just suck. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Lil Andy Wardle said that. Lil. Lil Andy uh, said that to me, but um, yeah, I mean, moral of the story is I want to go in person so then I can um, talk full shit on how much Adepticon is better, <laughs> but I, I know what I'd say and I'd still stand behind it not having been there, that if you have the means and you want to save up and you, you like something like that, let me tell you. <laughs> let me tell let you. Let me tell you about end of March, Chicago, Illinois, Okay. That's where you need to be. It's banging. It is banging on all cylinders. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, we're through the, uh, the we're through the preamble round. <laughs> I, I, I could have one more thing, even. Yeah, like, please this is, do. This is, please do. You want me to? Yeah, please do. All right, I gotta do this because Alex deserves this. I uh, I uh, had him assemble my demon ship MDF terrain while I was working on something else so that we could get B roll of it for a video, and my guy put all the magnets in the base in random order so that none of the polarity i know dude it's just like brother like this is not how it's supposed to work like they all push away from each other (laughs) yeah or like the terrain that goes on top is like well it works here but it doesn't work here uh yeah so he's editing this right now and he's hearing this and just probably feeling super shameful we we were able to get it apart and get all the magnets out but that was just hilarious Okay, Alex, do not feel bad because I've done that exact thing myself Yeah, two times. <laughs> You'd think after the first time and say, fuck me, I can't believe I'm so dumb to have done this, to do it again. <laughs> so don't feel bad. Now, if you do it again, we're going to talk about it again and give you more shit. This but is, yeah. I feel you, dude. This is retribution. This is a fucking magnets. How do they work? <laughs> oh, that's All great. right. I know what we painted. Or do you do you have more you want to talk about? No, no. I well, we got to keep this train of moving. The All only right. other thing I was going to talk about because now I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> it's getting it's finally fucking nice out in Minnesota. Oh, it's so dude. nice, it's so nice. Everything's starting to get green. Little buds on the trees. Yeah, I came to work in fucking Omega short shorts. Come on. Yeah, I don't. I don't know like about. I don't like that about <laughs> changing of the seasons. But um, I I've, I walk my dog extra long walks now, and I'm just like super fucking freezing my ass off and we just like go quick to get the exercise in for him um and just realizing remembering how much inspiration for miniature painting for art there is in nature and usually when it's a fucking frozen wasteland here i forget about that and every time in the spring i'm rejuvenated and i think again i'm like oh man how cool is that with the colors and the way the gnarled oak tree branches and the sky coming through and i actually um looked up as i was walking through my woods um chasing turkeys (laughs) story for a different time um i looked up and i had an idea for a scene for a golden demon piece looking up in the woods and i'm just and it's not just nature although that often inspires me but like places in in the city an alleyway or uh you know an old timey um main street on a small town right no there's there's just everywhere there's so many cool things that get your juices flowing so get off your phones and, and look at the world around you you fucking children yeah you fucking zoomers what the fuck get off your tickum tackums okay <laughs> all right what have we painted i'm so excited to, to look at the thing you painted thank you i'm you know what says, very proud of it you know what's wild about the this um this paint, pizza pizza boy here i painted it in two days uh that's wild <laughs> That's really fucking wild. And the, after having to walk <laughs> for 45 <laughs> minutes, you lost 45 minutes of painting. Uh, uh, I love the fucking, I love the cheese on the pizza so much. I why? I, I don't know. Okay, here's why. I think the last I, thing I painted. I was like think, so running out of steam at that point. Here's why I think I love it so much is this transition in the shadows to like a reddish, orangish up to yellow, almost like you're doing it in the layers that you do fire. You did it in a way that it like, I can like, 
I can taste that that cheese and sauce in the grease from the cheese through color. Yeah, bro, I can taste the cheese through color. Dang, dude, that's I mean, goddamn, it. it looks like fucking pizza cheese. I love it. Yeah, actually, you know what? I didn't think about. So okay, so I painted Pizza Boy bust from Mind Work Games. That's that's the first thing we'll talk about. And I painted it, and I tried to paint it in a comic book style, which is really challenging. Um, at least for me, it, the comic book style, I guess, traditionally is defined as very dark, recessed shaded lines, very distinct layers of color, not a whole lot of blending going on. But of course, the medium of comics goes all over the place. It's very different from artist to artist. But that's kind of like the general notion that you see in like Marvel comics and stuff like that. So I tried to do that for this guy. Um, and I think I struck a middle ground between kind of like this typical miniature painting approach and layers. Yes, there are layers of color you can see very distinctly. But like, I feel like you could only really see them when you kind of get really in close. And I think with comic books, they're like, it's very stark. And I actually had a thought. I was like, this guy is pretty much the same size as a panel that you would see in a comic book. So this should be a pretty good like, like mm-hmm. test, right? Because yeah. like, it's the same sca- like size and scale and stuff. Yeah, it is. Um, but I think I went a little too crazy with the amount of layers because they, they're kind of blending together into a seamless transition unless you get like really close. But... That being said, I'm really happy with just the outcome in general. I think it looks really cool. I'm really happy with like the plant that I uh, sculpted in uh, Fusion 360 and the background that I made that reminds me of a comic book frame and the chat bubble. Like it all, it all came together really, really nicely, and I'm very proud of it. Yeah, you very much should be. Although I can't believe you didn't uh, paint out a tiny freehand inverted picture of him taking his picture of himself. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Self, <laughs> as a selfie on his cell phone. Um, I I wouldn't do that either because, <laughs> because when you look at like where your main shot is, you can't you can't see that. Yeah, yeah. At all. Um, I, I think when we were when you shared this with the um with the triumvirate, um, <laughs> the triumvirate, we uh we were discussing the piece and and Vince um made a really profound statement as he does um, that it it really emphasizes the point the success that you have on this piece emphasizes the point that value and placement is so much more important and more impactful than blending yeah um, this is like a thing that I've talked about with comic book style before with like the models from Marvel United um, like there's this guy who paints them super well and it's just like I think that that is the most valuable miniature paint technique you can learn and I think I called it like value distribution in a previous mm. video as well it's like if you Good understand job. that um, you will you will tackle so many other things like blending is just like a, a fart in the wind compared to like <laughs> this idea of like like it's like it, it defines like see this is what you are yeah, you're you're a fart fart, you're fart, fart, in, fart in the wind <laughs> what the fuck is that from I forgot Wait, it's fucking sugar gay oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Mark McGrath, you gem. <laughs> yeah, dude, that is the that is the sickest burn. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. I think like that that idea like helps translate like what the material is, like where the light's coming from, the character of the light, like the color of the light, because different like different materials and different colors will react differently to light. It's just like there's just so much tied up in this idea, and like you really, it really comes to the forefront when you paint in this style. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you can't, you can't avoid it exactly because like, yeah. you have to lean so far into it. You can't, you can't like lean on. Well, I'll just make this be a nice blend here, and then at some point when you're focusing on that, you are distracting from the more important aspect. Pretty much, yeah. Um, you like my glossy black blend. Dude, tweeze your nipples, bro. <laughs> I'm just going to reference that for the rest of the episode. Yeah, I mean... I did little stripes like they do. Uh, whatever. I forget the name of the company. What was the name of the company? Uh, that was... Dark Messiah. Dark Messiah basis. Yeah, yeah. So I copied You that 3D one. printed that? Yeah, I sculpted and 3D printed it. Oh, yeah. I needed to have this like weird thing on the back that allowed me to glue on this frame. Okay, I thought that was... I, I thought that was a Dark Messiah base that you had that you printed off a thing for the topper of it and i was like damn how'd you get that smooth transition between that blade that plinth and that man that's pretty fucking sweet dude i can't like this kind of plinth like without the backdrop thing is so fucking easy to make so if you need like any kind of thing let me know i can whip it out in 10 minutes 100 percent. just whip it out i whip it out i need i need you to custom sculpt the 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 plinth plus 
um, all of the the base when I'm redoing my diorama, like the <laughs> for gold like the diorama. ground texture and shit. <laughs> yeah, what? I don't know how to do that. I mean, I mean, whatever. Uh, actually, uh, uh, actually, like uh, the plinth, but then it's gonna be kind of like a uh, what's it like an ice cream cone, upside down ice cream cone. Okay, but kind of add it, and it doesn't have to have any shapes, or whatever, because I can you know so a cone on that. Like it's a like peak? a cone. Yeah, it comes up to a peak, but it's gonna be slightly back because I'm gonna have the vampire on the kind of the peak, and they're gonna be kind of two lines circling back around from either side. It's going to be much more condensed scene where the, the, they're like coming from the background around the backside of the cone um, in like these little pads. So they're like, they're okay. That Maybe way. If you give me a drawing, I can see if I can do it. Yeah. I'm going to work with little Andy on that and uh, I'm going to sketch stuff up first so you can get the composition right, whatever. And then from there, cause it should be like, you know, like make the thing and then you just kind of like pull up a cone. I would right? say the the, the less symmetrical it is and like mathematical looking, the like the infinitely more challenging it is for me to do. All right, because you can just plop a cone on it. You can't like pull it, to take the top and just kind of like pull it back a little bit. Like, like there's like there's probably like eighteen different ways to do that. So maybe you can do what you're describing, but uh, I don't know how I do it initially. But it depends. Like just show me in a picture and I'll see what I can do. All right, just use cork. I have uh, yeah, that. <laughs> one story. I had a minor catastrophe while putting the model on the base. So I I took some calipers, measured the width of the the rod that I was going to use to mount the model in here, uh, and I like and I gave it like uh, like 0.2 millimeters of extra space because you have to give it extra space to actually fit. Yeah, and the fit was pretty tight um and it was working and like i could push it down and it, and it felt good um and then i painted the plant the rod and so oh. then i put it in and I could, oh. I could tell there was more resistance and i'm like fuck it and i just kept pushing and pushing ah! and the paint was peeling off of the thing <clears throat> as it was coming out and then i pushed it so hard that the rod in its hollow bent backward and i'm like fuck and so I, I grabbed some tweezers or like some pliers, stuck it under the model and like ripped the hollow styrene rod out. And I actually scuffed the glossy black thing, which you can see if you look at it on the side. Um, and the way I fixed it was I luckily, because of those, those styrene rods you bought forever ago, mm. I luckily had one that fit perfectly inside of the rod that I had put inside of my hole that was stuck in there now because I ripped it out. Oh. So it fit in there and so it was like a little Lego piece and there was still some remaining uh, hollow rod on the model and so I trimmed it short and then I just slipped it on top of that rod and so actually what I should be able to do. Oh God. He's pulling it out right now. He's pulling out his rod. <laughs> and he, oh, he broke the fucking speech I, bubble. There's no way that that was going to go off you see, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a puzzle piece now, and it, oh, uh, it, yeah. it just pops right in there. Boop, can rotate too. So you broke his model. I broke the model. He broke the thought bubble. That's it's super easy to fix. It's just a little super cool. It's a little boop boop. But yeah, yeah. Happy with that. What'd you paint? Um, ironically, and we didn't know this was happening at the same time. I was uh, approaching a, a similar style of painting while painting up some relic blade models. Oh. Um. So. Uh, I don't know if people knew this, but there was something called Other Games April, and I was planning on doing uh, at least one video for Other Games April, and other stuff was scheduled, and I thought I had this one set to go in April, and apparently I was wrong. Uh, so it released in May, so we're just going to keep it uh, moving forward to May. Um, I had been excited to paint some Relic Blade models for a while, and something that's got character... It's the, I want to say simplistic, but I don't mean that in a negative way. That no. There's not extra stuff added. Everything is there for a purpose, and it helps tell the story of the character. Um, the shapes are fun. The models have feel like they're um, – that each one is unique and sculpted kind of – kind of like a handcrafted sculpt, right? Um, and it doesn't feel kind of sterilized through ZBrush. Um, even though he uses ZBrush to sculpt all these, which I was shocked to hear. Uh, yeah, I kind of feel like maybe it was originally hand sculpted. No, he never done, never. never done them hand sculpted. Wow, okay. And what he does, though, because I talk about it in the video, is in my, I had a discussion with Sean. He sculpts in ZBrush like he's using clay. So, for instance, if he's going to make a hand, he'll take a little ball and he'll squish it. And then he'll form it. He connects it to the thing, and he forms it like it's clay. Oh, well, instead of like making like a finger and then a finger. Okay. Yeah, or using pre-generated things, and so everything feels like it is, like sculpted with tools by hand. Okay. Yeah. Speaking of that, 
I was informed that a lot of Patreons that like make all these models every single month, like month after month, have like. The paper Effect- dolls, effectively dolls that yeah. they clothe in yep. different clothing. Just because, like, if you think about it, they're making so much shit every single month that they have to kind of find some efficient route to get there, and that's the way they do it. Um, I mean, if you think about it, when you look at Space Marines, why wouldn't they fucking? I mean, not that's not three D printing, obviously, but if you look at Space Marines, why wouldn't they do the same thing? Because yeah. they kind of do all look and feel the same, but they change. It's how much they change. I think a lot of three D printing. Month, monthly Patreon ones, they're changing like five, ten percent. Whereas, like, if you're doing uh, different kinds of space marines, you're probably changing more of that. Well, but, the whole outward appearance of the model changes, so it's more than five percent. Well, like a vampire knight versus a chaos knight, f- generic versions of both, right? For for a Patreon, the dude underneath is the same dude with the same proportions and the same height and his face is slightly different for a vampire face or, mm-hmm. or whatever. And the, I think those two are particularly close in aesthetic, but maybe like two other ones would be a little bit more different. Yeah. Once they get to the armor stuff, right? I think yeah. they, they probably still start with the standardized. Here's a plate. Armor, I think you're probably right. They, f- they fucks with the details. Maybe they, they put way too many of them on. Um, so I went with kind of what I would describe as like an, an animated style where it's, I wanted the, the models to be very vibrant because it just feels like the, the sculpts and the style and the art style of this game goes towards a very animated, a very colorful, almost Disney like style. So it's not a comic book style. Obviously that I don't black line, but I do a dark lining over everything though. But I wanted the, the dark lining as opposed to yours where you went to, to pure black and a lot of that. I try to keep the a dark but still very saturated color. So everywhere on the model, there's just color. Um, and blending was not, also not a point at all. It happened kind of naturally sometimes, but it was more about using the, the volumes uh, of the shapes in a real obvious way because there's a lot of basic shapes on these and just leaning into those shapes um, and building up highlights in the same way. So I didn't use ice yellow. I didn't use off whites or whites um, almost at all um, for the building up of highlights. It was like using a vibrant sky blue as my mix in color or using a really strong peach or an orange or a lemon yellow to build things up. There's a broken anvil paint that's a lovely peach color. It's like red two or something. Yeah, yeah. I that this is painted all with broken anvil. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm, and I use the shit out of that color. That yeah. peach is so fucking nice. I know. Um, these look fucking great. Uh, the painting style is great. I've noticed over the the history of looking at your models that you, I don't know if this is true. Do you tend to prefer doing like a quicker NMM to TMM? Yeah. Interesting. I think as I've gotten proficient with it. Like getting fast with a ba- with like a basic t uh, basic NMM yeah 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 um I think I just it feels like there's less at least to me and this is, this is all personal preference it feels like it's less disjointed like it feels okay. like it lives in the same world more instead yeah, of like yeah. this is the metals and then this is the rest of the model yeah that's um, like that definitely is how you get there I love the elf girl's pose dude she's I just no gonna fucking whack you in this thing yeah she's got a big ass sword she feels so like weightless I know yeah she does yeah um yeah so she's super fun and I, I really wanted to try to mix because there's no teal in the range and so I wanted to see how well they mix and they work mix really well to still keep really vibrant colors because they're so saturated and basically none almost none of their colors have much white gray or black in the paint and so it, it lends itself while well well is the word I was looking for so yeah I wanted something that was like on the table when you're playing a game would stand out and be fun and vibrant and easy to 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 see um but also doesn't take long to paint that way like we're not blending anything we're starting with a how long uh about f- four hours a model that's still pretty decent. Like yeah. you, you gave him some work. Yeah, I did. I certainly gave him work, and that's mostly because you, if you were gonna paint with, like, you really want really saturated, punchy tones. There's not a lot of ways to like get away with that easy. Yeah, the closest thing you could say would be doing sp- speed paints or contrast paints, um, but then you have the issues of highlighting over top of those. Which, unless you go desaturated, they often 
they're they're tough because you can't mix in your saturated base color that was a contrast paint into a bright peach to create the first highlight it it doesn't work cuz you're like mixing liquid and freaking paint and then it's just a sloshy mess so you can do that kind of with the contrast paint but i feel like it's just i just want to have regular paints that i use for whatever i want to paint yeah i know yeah it just you just have more control and i yeah. totally agree with you so are these people from different like uh factions uh so there's a there's a good there's like a good faction a bad faction and then there's neutrals and neutrals so as you're making your war bands you can basically use anything from evil if you're evil anything from good if you're good and neutrals can be either or and so she's technically a neutral oh nice and he's obviously a bad pick so um yeah so you can you can kind of mix and match and then i was realized i was like oh, i want to do one good and one bad and i'm like damn if i would have just done like a <clears throat> A couple more bads I could have uh, you only need like five people for a war band but now I'm gonna have I can I got a couple more built and primed and you can set to go to make a couple war bands a couple, couple war bands okay very yeah nice. sexy teeth Joshy is uh came over to my house the other day and he grabbed a whole bunch of my war war cry boxes and he's putting together the terrain for me <laughs> so we're gonna have war cry terrain for age of sigmar for war cry for this and to use it for D and D because some of those some of those older Warcry terrain things are, are like just primo great fantasy terrain. Yeah, they're like they're getting crazier now. Yeah, I don't like fucking meat trees and bamboo bridges. Yeah, everything's a fucking meat tree connected to a bamboo bridge. Yeah, or like the the one side that I had, I can't remember what it was called. Red Red Harvest, Red Harvest. Like there was like this giant tower of like buckets that were like on like a track that would like go up and down and like they that's had, one where it's like the lava one. Yeah, there's like a, there's like like a, a lava a, track. Yeah, it, oh, what does like, it remind me of? It reminds me of like the coal shoot and like Indiana Jones and uh, yes, it does. Like, kind of like that. It reminds me of Marble Madness, but only people of a certain age will understand what Marble Madness is. Marble Madness. I, I mean, I can I can kind of guess based on what we're talking yeah, about. One of the greatest regular Nintendo games ever released. Mm. Anyway, anyway, um, you got a couple more things you painted. Yeah, I painted uh, Baylor Black Tide. I replaced him. He was already painted. Uh, <laughs> the redo, the redo, and then I Redux. painted the re and then I painted two gravesite markers to finally have four painted gravesite markers. And God damn it, this guy lost his pointing finger last <laughs> night. He got nubbed, dude. He got fucking clipped, bro. God damn it, I just noticed that right now. Oh no. Oh, well. Well, that's He's cool. A fucking skeleton, you know. Dude, painting gravesite markers is so such a fun little side thing to do. So easy. Yeah, it's just like, oh, what cool, weird, little funky undead thing do I have, or can I kit bash, or can I whatever, and just use it. And then you feel rewarded when you complete those because it's like, no matter which faction of undead I play, no matter which one is is good, or I want to try out something new, I'll always be able to use these. Mm -hmm. And they're from Cursed City, so I can just they're they're like they're like mysterious tokens or something, and so I'm just. Just chipping away at that Cursed City box. Like, I'm right going to fucking finish it, and I'm going to play it, and it's going to be epic, I swear to God. Okay. I heard that old man with cat is good now in the new book. Oh. In the Cursed City box. He looks like an old hobo, and he's got like a, he's got a oh, raven. a long, like, trailing, like, robe thing, and he's got like a weird, like, pope hat, and he's kind of like, short, and, wait, who's old man with cat? So he's got a cat, he's got like a rat on one hand, he's got a bird on one hand, he's got what looks like, like, um stocks like the stockade you know when you're stuck in the stocks it's a little piece of wood around his back oh, okay i think i know what you're talking about but he's like a super cheap caster that does some nasty other shit too he's like he's like replacing necromancers and lists now. is his name torgilius chamberlain does that sound right that's, i don't know why the fuck his name came into my head yes i think that's it <laughs> okay cool all right that's what we painted for today what did you paint let us know in the top facebook group which is linked down in the description and show notes depending on where you're listening this week, our sponsor is Dragon Trapper's Lodge, and they're showing off their latest offering over on Patreon, The Dark Woods. Every month, Dragon Trapper's Lodge offers over 25 unique models plus more, and it only costs you 12 John Bucks. Or real bucks, whichever <laughs> you prefer. You've been saving those John Bucks? Yeah. <laughs> Now's the time. <laughs> If you subscribe in May, you'll get over 50 unique sculpts. That's more than twice their normal offering. This month, they've released a new army called the Dark Woods, and all the models are themed around dark and twisted fey creatures with a similar aesthetic to what else? What else? What else? But more metal. They're skeletal trees with scythes. 
You'll also get fawns, armored bear owls, centaur chiefs, hags, and a tree dragon called Dryagon, which is the silliest and perfect name for this beast. Don't forget the awakened trees. They're just trees with faces, but they give me Wizard of Oz vibes, and I really appreciate that. Dragon Trapper Lodge has their Patreon separated into two different $12 tiers, so make sure you listen closely to figure out which one is best for you. Soldier tier is for you if you're into big army games. It includes one full army book that's compatible with one-page rules. Or maybe big army games aren't your thing and you prefer to sit behind the Dungeon Master's screen and work really hard to kill all your players. In that case, the Trapper tier is for you because all of the goodies included have a 5th edition stat block associated. Both tiers include a 30% discount code for their store on My Mini Factory that lasts the whole month to help you get some of their previous offerings like the Primate Army, the Simiax Legions. If you can't decide between war games and tabletop RPGs, for 18 bucks a month, their veteran tier includes the offerings from both stat blocks, a one-page rule army book, all of the models, plus new subclasses and magic items. Probably the best of all, all of Dragon Trapper's Lodge's models come pre-supported so you can quickly get them out of the printer and under your brush, helping you paint more minis. So make sure you head on over to patreon.com backslash Dragon Trapper's Lodge, whether you're a soldier and you're into the war game side or a trapper and into the D&D side, they've got you covered. You can also find all of their older releases available on My Mini Factory. That and also their Patreon are all linked in the description and show notes below. Thank you to Dragon Trapper's Lodge for sponsoring this episode. Now on to the main topic. All right, before we get into the topic, we had to like we had to cut a little bit out here because we got sucked into talking about Age of Sigmar and different undead units and scrolling stu- through stuff. But now we're here for the real goodies, right? <laughs> All right. The topic for today is painter profiles, which is a great idea that John had about categorizing the types of personalities you see in the miniature painting hobby. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to put each of you into a box and we're going to analyze you and tell you all the things that are wrong with you from miniature painting and everything else. (laughs) (laughs) And you got, you like, I'm surprised. Like I I was streaming, uh, the agency mark game yesterday Mm -hmm. while you, um, were making this list and you you were like, you should add any, if you can think of any. And so then I like went to the list and you had like this fucking full blown, like seven different like personality types with like names and descriptions. So like, did you just riff this or have you been like thinking about this? I, I started with riffing it and then I quickly realized like this was all in my head already. And it didn't take me very long to find each group. Um, and I guess the the thought behind this topic, what came into my head is lately, um, from the gaming perspective, um, we've been talking more about and hearing more about, mostly through Vince, is the psych, uh, psychographic profiles yes. for, for gamers, right? Yeah. What kind of gamer are you and what do you get out of the game? What excites you about the game? What makes you happy in the game? What do you want to experience in the game? Mm-hmm. Um, and so to take a spin on that from the perspective of the hobby side, the painting side, and I think not only categorizing these, but then kind of analyzing, finding where you sit in them, where you maybe float between them, um, what you can do to either improve, get more joy out of your hobby, or if you wanted to change, what were some things you would have to do to change from one group to another? Oh, okay. Yeah, because these are this is a, like a this is like a more of a flow chart. You're not like in this box forever, oh, for sure. Yeah, but I think we've captured. Every type of painter in these lists. Okay. I'm excited to get started with the first one, which is Chad. Yeah. (laughs) This is great. So Chad is the kind of person who views miniature painting as an absolute chore, is not interested at all in it, and will only play the game with likely unpainted miniatures or models that are painted by somebody else. It's not worth even buying the paintbrushes and the paints. Just like the game is the ultimate thing. Yeah, for them, it's not a hobby. It's just a game. Yeah. Right. So it if they were to sell these things in, in pre-painted, um, that would be actually ideal for them. Because <laughs> then they <laughs> wouldn't have to pay a commission painter to paint all their stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you know any chads? Uh, I do, but mostly f- from local people that I ended up early on in my painting career 
um, did commission work for them. Okay, that's exactly the same for me. I'm going to give a shout out to my buddy uh, Scott, who I painted his Blood Angel army for and is still my friend to this day. Uh, that guy, I don't think, has ever touched a model, and he has and has had, I don't know, six, seven painted 40K armies. Uh, he is He's all about the game. He does not care about the hobby at all. Yeah, and Chad doesn't... Um he actually prefers he or she prefers to buy used models if they can because they're already assembled oh yeah. okay that's a characteristic yeah, okay yeah chad doesn't even want to assemble the crap yeah. and that's why he's always looking for deals on ebay or big you know big lots of an army when you see those in the buy sell groups a lot chad is oftentimes the purchaser of those because if, because it's all about the game the more armies and models you collect the more different games you can play with different factions and that's what's important not actually customizing or making one your own through your own painting do you think that chad can appreciate other people's painted armies or he's kind of just like sets down the models and lets it rip he's like i don't care about that Let's go. um yeah because i right we're we're kind of i would have walked the fine line of there's a, a wide array within each of these boxes of chads or, or <laughs> <laughs> there's all chads yeah, there's a whole fucking box of, there's a hanging chad there's uh there's a there's a whole lot of chads here and um i think most chads could give a fuck less about how well, how well yours are painted. <laughs> yeah. He is focused on the game yeah. and how to beat you. More often than not, we're digging into the the, the gamer side. Uh, Chad really wants to win. Yeah. You know? Not always. It aligns with the Spike personality pretty well. Yeah. I actually know it. Uh, I know a, a local Chad <laughs> that only plays like narrative games and stuff. And it isn't like super hardcore Spike that just wants to win and wants to crush all his enemies and that is where fun derives mm -hmm. but he just does not care whatsoever okay. about the hobby side okay and i was really kind of curious about chad whether or not he should be included in this list because this is not the, really a painter right yeah this yeah. is the hobby and painter profiles um but i think it's required i think it's it's a part of of the hobby for sure yeah so if there's a if this is like a gas tank and there's a percentage of gas and gas is equated to hobby love <laughs> he's he, at zero he's at 0% he's on empty <laughs> he's on empty right <laughs> so so that's 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 it in chad now when it comes to the painting hobby to dig just a little bit deeper into, into chad here i think we'll dig more into other ones cuz Chad's pretty uh, shallow when it comes to his actual, uh, <laughs> how we want to dig into the hobby goodness. Also, if there's any Chads that listen to this podcast, wow, I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, sound good. off in the comment section if you're a Chad. <laughs> yeah. If you're a Chad. So um, I think the, oh, fuck. I totally lost my train of thought, thought on what, what a very valuable thing I was going to say about Chad's. Okay, no, the value of Chad's. Chad's have a, a very distinct value, an important value in the hobby. They keep commission artists employed. They keep. Was that what you were going to yes. say? <laughs> That's it. That is 100% it. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. Because if you follow in one of these other profiles, oftentimes you will be able to find a Chad and, and you'll be able to paint stuff and, and get money for painting something if you're excited about or you enjoy doing. Yeah, okay. Um, so what you're saying is if you want to be a commission artist, you got to, like a Pokemon trainer, have to go find yourself a Chad. Yeah, you got to collect them With all. With some disposable income. Yeah, it, it's, Chads are, there's like a sliding scale of how valuable a Chad is in the hobby and it's directly correlated to his disposable income. <laughs> the more money Chad has to spend on this shit, the better. What about a 40 year old Chad? You know, maybe double income, no kids. Like, yeah. that is like the fucking Charizard of uh, Chads. Yeah, that's it. That's, that is the Chadizard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't so, know if Charizard is even a rare Pokemon, but you know. Go yeah, for so it. if you know any whales that are, they're like mini hobbyist whales. So a whale is somebody in video games that, in pay to win video games, they, they're the reason why people still make pay to win video games and why they're the most profitable games because they spend a fuckload of money. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if there's a whale Chad in your area, you just need to refer to him as Chadazar. <laughs> Chadazar. <laughs> What's the next one, Scott? You uh, you t called this one Red. Okay, so Red. I named him Red 
after Red Foreman from the show, that 70s show. Mm. Um, and I, I, maybe people don't know this, but it was more of like, I, I pictured a crotchety old dad um, that usually doesn't have good things to say, and he just calls people dumbass all the time. Okay, this is like the main one of the main characters' father, who's bald, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Red Foreman. Yeah, he's he is. Uh, what's his name's brother? Ah, oh, god damn it. Anyway, uh, the dude who did Apollo thirteen. Fuck me. Anyway, uh, so yeah, so this could be anything. He could be Al Bundy. He could be uh, the guy from All in the Family, and I'm blanking on his name too it could be any crotchety de- I, most of these things are pop culture references <laughs> the names. so this is red who is red uh doesn't particularly like painting not interested in improving but will endure the torture of pain to get it done always looking for the secret easy way contrast paints slap chop shotgun airbrush dry brushing etc 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 yes yes so so what if do you think do you think that a red you could be like a 13 year old red that converts into a Chad later in life when you have money to spend on commission painting. Oh yeah. That oftentimes can be now <laughs> that, that oftentimes these two can are, are fairly close. Sure. Right? Yeah. Which is why I was wondering if they should both exist, but I do think they are distinctly different. Yeah. I think these two could go back and forth. Oftentimes if I'm a Chad, but like I don't, want to spend the money i don't have the money i do not give a fuck about it i will maybe turn into a red for a while just to get the shit done yeah you'll dip your toes you'll buy the bare minimum synthetic brushes washes like okay I'm rattle sure. can as much as you can yeah three yep. color minimum mm-hmm. whatever yeah yes and so but vice versa you're right. Someone could be a red because they didn't have money to do it, and then they get older and they or they get money, and they're like, "I'm gonna off put this as yeah. soon as I can." Yeah, if I'm still in the hobby. The other thing is that you might enjoy a different part of the hobby other than gaming. Like you might like you might like basing. You might like, like we have a friend like uh, Dan. He's he, he's huge on kit bashing. Yeah, not so huge on painting, and so he does a lot of contrast paints. And you know, I can always tell that whenever Dan tells me like about his models, that he has like a tiny amount of shame. That he like uses contrast paints and stuff, but like really you shouldn't at all feel that because like the hobby is 100% what you make it. And if you're into kit bashing, if you're into list writing, if you're into collecting models and stuff like that, like you can you can enjoy that thing for what it is and not feel bad that you're not like making the models look like the box art or like the best version of that model that you've seen on the internet or something like that. So no shame if you're any of these profiles. Yeah, of that there's there's two really good points there. And I'll forget the second one. So which one do I want to start with? Um, <laughs> uh, these profiles are not a list of better and worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are not starting with Chad and then Red because those are the two worst ones. They are not worse. You right? you have uh, an interesting actually. It, it, it does follow a, it. It does. Oh yeah, an order here. It does follow an order. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And we'll see if you guys can figure it out as we get more and more into it. Yes. Um. So that's first and foremost. These are not about shaming or uh celebrating any of these tiers it's about identifying what they are because i think if we can identify things about ourselves which are oftentimes difficult because we're living with ourselves all the time if we can identify it then we can almost look at it as if it's uh something uh outside of ourselves and look at it objectively this is incredibly true and very poignant for me right now i hate it when things get in my way and recently I've been getting in my own way. Mm. And so when that happens, I really become introspective about like, what am I doing that's causing myself problems to try to fix it? That's the same way with tools and the hobby. Like when a thing gets in my way, I either replace it or figure out why it's causing that problem and fix it. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting thing. You kind of have like this out of body experience where like you are, you know, able to look at yourself objectively. Yeah. Interesting. The yeah. second point I wanted to make was that you remembered. Uh, I did remember, but I'm trying only, to be only because it, it piggybacks off of what you said mm. and relates directly to a conversation I had that didn't make the final cut of the video um, with Sean Sutter, the creator of Relic Blade. And that was about celebrating and welcoming all the different aspects of this hobby in which aspect of this hobby you f- take the most joy in and if that thing isn't painting, you shouldn't be any less passionate or you shouldn't be shamed. 
by the fact that that's not your thing. If buying the game, reading the book, and just collecting the models is your hobby, that is a hobby. Mm-hmm. And you that is not lesser of a hobby. So what Red gets out of his hobby isn't any lesser. It's just different. And because we're looking at it through the lens of painting, it is... Um, it may seem that we're looking at it through negative light, but we need reds. Why do we need reds, Scott? Can you think about that? Mm. I think we need reds way more than we need chads. They're both valuable, but I think we need reds a lot. Uh, I mean, aside from the fact that just like any kind of hobbyist engaging in the hobby is good for the health of the hobby. I'm not sure specifically why reds have uh, unique value. Okay, they they allow me to uh, dunk on them with my painting skills. How about True. That? Yeah, that is value. By comparison, I'm a fucking god. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's good. <laughs> I have no. What's the answer? Um, I don't. I don't know if there is an answer, but oh. I, I have my. I have. I'm just. It's more of an open ended question, and okay. we pose this. And this part of this conversation, I think, today is for. Um, trust interact with the goody peepees too is like what are your thoughts these are not we have not stress tested this and gone to a group of our peers to have them review <laughs> this to ensure that this these lists are are finalized and perfect in all this that and the other in fact maybe over time this is just the the catalyst for these becoming more defined things if there's value in that here i know why they're valuable i just thought of it okay tell me um I think reds are the most likely people to finish painting an army entirely. And for someone like me who has always struggled with like finishing war bands and finishing armies, it's incredibly inspirational to see like um, someone finish their thing and be happy with it. Like, cause like I think a lot of hobbyists will not even get to the point of finishing something because they're so wrapped up in being concerned with the outcome and it's just like, oh my God, I, I cannot paint this thing until I am sure of how I'm going to paint it um, so that uh, it's like perfect and flawless and just how my imagination envisioned it. And reds, they don't really care about that at all. Yeah. Like it's like I am painting it because in my world, models are painted for a miniature war game. And that is what's important, not necessarily my vision or the quality of the paint job. And so reds for me, and this might sound like a critique, but it really isn't remind me that not everything needs to be perfect and that when things are finished, they look good on the table. Yeah. And so they've really helped me to pu- push down my expectations and finish things like my death rattle skeletons that I like took a lot of shortcuts on that I normally wouldn't have. That look really great. So um, that is a huge value. A painted model is a good model. Yeah. Um, that's not at all where, where my brain went in then yours is equally as valuable as what, what what I was thinking. So that's pretty cool. I also think, side note, th- what you're talking about, about a reds, getting it, just getting it done and getting it painted on the table is the off-ramp for maybe reds moving into a different place. It is. On a different profile. It is. That level of satisfaction, that level of of feeling like they completed something that, that they created something and seeing it on the table and use it may open them up to being um, a transition red. <laughs> <laughs> a red in transition. Yeah, red in transition. <laughs> but my thought why reds are so valuable, um, and I'll use uh, kind of some data points and then- oh, Data points? Holy yeah, shit, some, are we getting official right yeah, now? Yeah, I'll use the data points and then I will go back to um, being ridiculous. Go back to what my point is of why reds are valuable. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, Scott, what videos, just in general, on YouTube, when it comes to painting, tend to be the most viral, get the most views, the most views from like maybe your stuff, maybe my stuff, maybe any anybody that creates content? Beginner-focused stuff beginner focused um when everyone created their contrast paint videos what did they, did those do well i mean you did but the product was really hype at the time yeah i think what maybe the answer you're fishing for is um techniques that show people that they can get nice looking models very easily my 
most popular video ever. I, I don't know for sure if I look through total views, but like by how long it's been out is Slap Chop 2.0 by a metric ton. They, these are the data points. So if we were to look, if I were to look across most hobby YouTube channels, whether it's Goobs and his intro to painting, yes. whether it's our speed of any of the speed paint contrast videos, whether it's the slap shot videos, whether it's the, you know, get it done quick with an airbrush. Every time it's a speed, the word paint fast, speed paint, awesome, but quick. <laughs> yes. You know, the, the five, uh, the 10 hour, one hour, 10 minute showing the fast things that still look good. Those all do the best. Yeah. Why do they do the best? Because here's my point of the value of reds. There are a literal fuck ton of reds yeah. in this hobby. I would I would say that there are probably as many reds as there are all of these other categories put together. That is how many reds there are. That's a bold claim. Also, you're a liar, sir. Mm. That Top Top 2.0 is your third most popular video. Oh. The second most popular video is destroying two hundred dollars in Warhammer to create a custom model. Well, that video is like a year and a half older. So. And can you guess what your most popular video is? I I don't know. Painting like the Warhammer box art is a lie. Yeah, I need to make another one of those. And you're like you're like you're looking at the box art and you're barfing. You're barfing. Yeah, yeah dude. Yeah, get get that nargle barf. Nargle barf. Um, there are. And, and maybe it's not that there's more than everyone else combined, but there's the, I think they are the biggest percentage for this entire profile list. Maybe, yeah. Um, and why that's valuable for us is because that means they are into the hobby, they are spending money, they are playing games, meaning more awesome models are created, meaning more games are come out are come out with. There's more money in circulation in the hobby and more companies that invest in this hobby. And we get to reap the sweet, sweet nectar that dribbles off their chins. I would say, at the very least, they're the ones that are most tuned into the like the YouTube, like me or like social media in general, because they're thirsty for those techniques. You know, they're thirsty for those quick but efficient like moves you can make. Yeah, because they want to get it done fast. So mm -hmm. someone tell me how to get it done fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. they are. They like like I wrote down here. They are always looking for the super secret, easy, fast mm -hmm. way. Right. Absolutely. And other people are still interested in that because if I watch a video that you have done on something, how to speed paint something or how to do something efficiently, fastly, I will still take something from that. And I'm not a red, but I won't want to absorb all steps and do them in the exact same order like a red would. Right. Yeah. You yeah, you re-envision it for sure. Yeah. It's, it's still valuable information. All right. The next one. Do you know the reference from this? Do you know? It's Stony. Do you know who Stony is? Um, No. From Estonia. Is this a wait? What is this a Encino man? No, it's not. What is this? It's Encino man. It is. Stony is Pauly Shore's character from Encino man. Well, okay. Damn, I didn't think you'd actually seen Encino man. Wait, but what? Munching on some grinders. Oh yeah, dude. I got my cave nugs. Uh, <laughs> I uh, asked Please. my wife, <laughs> I asked my wife if I could call her wife nugs after we watched that video, and she was like, "No." Uh, but uh, fuck, Stony. Yes, Pauly Shore is a goddamn gem. Yes, he is. I fucking love Pauly Shore. Okay, so <laughs> you're Stony. Who is who is Stony? Scott Stony. Uh, the hobby is holistic. Everything is in balance. Gaming, painting, socializing. Painting is often therapeutic, but not a priority. It brings a calm joy, and that's why Stony likes it. Improvement isn't usually the goal, but it can happen anyways because Stony enjoys the process. And apparently, James, our writer, is a Stony. Or is oh, that you? I didn't know. That's not me. It's gotta be James then. It's gotta be James. I thought it was you. No, because you're definitely a stony. <laughs> not fucking stony. <laughs> Painting is pain, dude. Yeah. Like it's not joy. And through the pain, <laughs> we we become glorious. <laughs> um, so this was a this is an interesting one, and I, I went a little bit more like in maybe the words and description that I use, a little bit maybe a more flower power, a little bit more hippie side of the way I described it. And you don't have to be that kind of yin and yang kind of type of a person to still be a stony. I know a lot of stonies. They like different aspects of the hobby. And because the hobby has these different aspects, that's why they enjoy it because it's, it's as a whole, it's holistic. Nice variety. Yeah. yeah. And they don't, 
they don't feel like they have to sit down and paint every night. They may go a month or two without painting, but eventually they'll get back to it if they get a new box game or they, they start a new game or they're excited to, to paint some terrain for something and they'll do it. And then it reminds them that they enjoy doing it and it is a something that they typically don't put a lot of stress on themselves over, um, but it's the the feeling of, of completing a thing, that they did the thing and they get to use the thing and it, uh, again, connects to other parts of the hobby. A unique situation that John and I are in as content creators is that we get to hear a lot of voices in the hobby, which allows us to, which allows John to form these profiles, but also we just hear a lot of like comments and Mm -hmm. you can start to like see trends and a trend that I see all the time in my comment section is people referring to painting as therapy, Mm -hmm. um, which I don't think it necessarily is for me. It sometimes is and it sometimes isn't kind of depends on like what I'm doing, what the mindset is and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, it's a huge thing. It's a huge thing for like soldiers to like do therapy. It's a huge thing. People who have like very stressful jobs who come home and have to like, you know, they need to really unwind from their job. Um, and that's really special. Like that's a, that's a cool thing. Stonies teach me to fucking relax. Yeah. You know, I take it so seriously. I think the, the hobby helped a lot of people, particularly over COVID for sure. Like when, when you're trapped inside and there's this feeling of isolation, that's something that can relax you so i think some of that is kind of the foundation um of where stony came from in in a profile um and i'll shout out i don't know if he wants me to or not last weekend i was in target (laughs) just looking at at the the nintendo switch games as you do as you do uh, in target did you buy any and uh, i did not i did not there was uh, they weren't on sale i was checked was like oh is there any 10 or 10 or 20 bucks off for a game i wanted to get anyway kind of like Mm -hmm. find the right time um, but I had to kill some time before the movie started. I was going to see, uh, you know, okay, okay. 15 minutes ago. Get some candy? Uh, snuck in some candy. Like a nice. motherfucker. From Target or no? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 You got that, that, uh, Reese's, that Reese's take five, bro. Ooh. Sometimes you want to little take fives in there. Um, <laughs> and I'm staring at, I'm sitting there looking through the games and I'm by myself and someone says, says my name. I'm like, are you John Ninas? And I was like, turn around. I'm like, why are you serving me court papers? <laughs> <laughs> You're just a peanut. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he's, he's like, Oh no, I, I, uh, and he was immediately kind of like nervous, which is great. His name was Will. Good guy from the town I'm from. And we had a fun conversation and he's like, watch the video, listens to the podcast. Nice. Um, and he's a stony. I found out, mm-hmm. you know, and he talked to me about, you know, later on he messaged me on discord too. And he just was thanking us for this and he talked about the the therapy and the the things that have really helped him and thanked us for doing this content. So, Will, it was great to meet you. Um, those is, That's an example of something you talked about where, like, we absorb all this. And that's where when I said, like, when I just sat down and started writing this, it just came because, unbeknownst to me, we've been taking in these data points as you're reading the comments in you know in your videos when you're checking the facebook groups in in our discords i mean there's tons of of places where we're absorbing or we listen to you and and we you know are doing our hobby just the same and on social media in a similar way um we kind of take these things in and that's where i think stony came from um so maybe red could become a stony if they completed a thing they feel this feeling of satisfaction. They understanding the more holistic nature of how the hobbying and the painting makes them have more satisfaction in the playing or maybe thinking about, oh, but I could then customize my own chapter. I could write my own lore. I'd come up with my own paint scheme. I'd see it to fruition. And that could be a way. They may still not care about improvement as much, mm-hmm. but they find the, the joy in the other pillars of the hobby and they... They get a little stony in them. Yeah. I, I see stony as like a very, it's like a river, you know, it's just very slow flow. I don't see them as outcome dependent. They're not very like, like finishing a thing isn't super important. Like they'll finish it whenever it, it's done. You know, it's kind of like just, just whatever. Yeah. Um, that's, 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 that's the way it's feeling at least. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's keep moving. Uh, this one, I think the next one's don't have a cultural reference they're just kind of a name and so maybe we can leave it up to the uh goody peepees if they have a better name ideally a cultural reference pop cultural reference for each of these next one is bunny scott uh who is bunny 
Bunny has so much energy and excitement for the hobby, but not quite there yet on any particular skill. That doesn't stop them from jumping in blindly and enjoying the ride, however. Can often drink straight from the fire hose and get overwhelmed because there's so much to learn. Where to begin? Will Benny burn? Will Benny? Where to begin? Will Bunny burn out and endure the flames or endure the flame? My bad. That was totally butchered. Um, <laughs> but yeah, lots of newcomer energy wants to take it all in. I think this is where gear acquisition syndrome thrives. Right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Buddy, if if you are new-ish to mini painting between zero and maybe two or three years. and Two or three years? Yeah. I think you can be a bunny for a longer period of time. I think things like the gear acquisition syndrome, maybe how quickly you pick up on techniques, maybe how much time you actually get to paint, it can elongate how you know how much you or how long you are a bunny i think you could be a bunny your entire painting career sure. um but oftentimes it feels like a, a bunny is the spot that it has the shortest shelf life in general of of a, of a profile where you'd move out of being a bunny but you don't have to and that's not a bad thing if you don't it does seem like this is more of a transitionary stage right like this is when you're you're first experiencing a hobby and soaking it all in and kind of really figuring out like where you want to live in it right, right. it's like i just you're just kind of absorbing everything because you have all the energy to do yeah. so i often see bunnies signing up for pro painters patreons oh yeah and they this isn't a slight on people that do that, but they don't have the foundational skills yet to really take advantage of what really high level stuff that those painters are, are able to teach because they're going right to the fire hose and it can be overwhelming of, do you crash and burn? Um, or do you endure, maybe take a step back or maybe just go all in. So yeah, this is a, this is a unique person who learns miniature painting in our current era, which has endless like information available on the internet, and this wants to fill up. So I don't know if this is in this category or the next one. Would you say this kind of person is the kind of person on like on a Discord who can like who can talk the talk, but not necessarily walk the walk? Like they know the right answers, they know the things you're looking for, but the execution isn't there yet. I think, or is this the next uh, future? I one? think that could be both. Okay, okay, I think that could be both. I think um, maybe more of the next one in, in Chip, but I think um, bunnies want to want to figure it all out, and they they watch a lot of videos. They sometimes bunnies don't even paint very much. Honestly, okay, like it, 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 this might be a critique of them. It totally isn't. Okay, I always say this analogy: a food critic cannot make food very well very often they just know what good food looks like what it tastes like and like all that stuff like they're very well versed in the word world of food so a bunny could be that same thing for the miniature hobby and that you know that's okay it's fine yeah and so a bunny may see this amazing nmm gold armor and say I'm going to jump right into that. I'm going to order this paint set because that's the paint they use. I'm going to buy a $25 paintbrush. I'm going to get all these things because that looks freaking amazing. And they and I want to learn how to do it. Meanwhile, Bunny's only painted three minis in their life. Yeah, yeah. And they have... Wait, are you a bunny? Were you a bunny? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> very much, very much so. Like, I wanted to absorb it all. I wanted to fall asleep with all the painting buddha videos under my pillow and just absorb it by osmosis yeah but um that excitement is a really good thing yeah because that is a fuel that can keep a bunny going um and in this age of information the bunny needs to be wary because oh. this is where a bunny can crash and burn when i talked about that is you get too much too quick before your legs have caught up to you right your brain is going 100 miles an hour but you're still just jogging and you can you can fall on your face a little bit there also your level of expectation does not meet your skill um and so it can lead to disappointment like when you are attempting ben comet style nmm and this is the third model you've painted and what you paint understandably looks like ass um so i think that that can also a bunny can also be met with crushing defeat 
when like reality kind of sweeps in and, and is like, you're not good at this yet. Like you need a lot more practice. So I think this is a, this is kind of a dangerous area of like, very dangerous. Like you, you, uh, you have all this beautiful miniature art in front of you on Instagram and stuff. And it's just not, it's not lining up with your current skill level because the, th- the thing that an Instagram photo does not show is the 20 years of practice that that painter has been grinding away with shit model after shit model and in the beginning of their career. So yeah. it's, it's a, it's a tough place to be. My, my origin, I didn't even think of this at all about myself in this, but my origin story was 100% a bunny. The very first model I ever painted was a Stormcast Eternal model that I did in full NMM gold armor yeah. that I followed and learned from Ben Comet's video on painting that using loaded brush. So I did loaded brush, non-metallic metal, gold armor for the very first model I ever painted, and it 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 turned out okay in the grand scheme of things, but it was, com- it was complete shit because I didn't understand the basics first yeah. and understand, you know, how you work with the base coats, how big that your, your spot highlight should be, how little you should have pure white showing, how reflections work, all these things I did not get grasp um, or did not take into account as I'm working my way through the process. I'm just trying to do the amazing thing that I see somebody else do. And when I see them do it in that video, it sure looks fucking simple. But now look at him. Now yeah. he's a full-time YouTuber, and you can be too with three <laughs> easy payments of nineteen <laughs> nine. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, plus shipping and handling. <laughs> <laughs> I think at some point I was also a bunny. I remember working at Cray and hating my life. And instead what I did at work because I was terrible was I would – there were no YouTube channels at the time. So I collected painting blogs like, I don't know, coke memorabilia uh i had this huge like i remember i favorited them on google chrome i had a little folder for blogs i had like 50 or 60 blogs that uh i was subscribed to with rss feeds that would notify me whenever they put a new article out and i'd always get new articles every single day because i followed a bazillion of them um and uh i i loved doing that i loved absorbing all that information because i remember thinking i was like okay i'm at work right now i can't paint while i'm at work but I can still improve. <laughs> yeah, dude. by reading content. Yes, uh, I was the same. I was the same <laughs> way. I think it's a big thing for bunnies is when if you have the passion for this, you find a way. You find try, a way to try to improve. Yeah, like vicariously yes. through someone else. Yes, um, through that, and that information is really, really good. Yeah. Um, but without execution, it's meaningless. Yeah. So I think one of the things that I was like, in theory, hoping to do with this was to help people see where they fit or maybe they fall into two boxes or maybe it's I'm here right now or I saw myself as that or to ask yourself the question and try to figure that out is if you are a bunny um you know what you what you can do are you happy with being there is that where you want to be do you feel like if you were in a different box that you think you would get more out of your hobby you think you'd enjoy your hobby more you think that that's actually more in line with where I want to go as a painter um, maybe you'd rather be a stony. Maybe a bunny wants to turn into a stony. And then how do you do that? Also, what pitfalls um, or what ways to maximize your your profile, your bucket that you're in? If you're a bunny and you want to be a stony, you go to the nearest 7-Eleven and you just drink straight from the fucking icy uh, spout. Yes. And then get yelled at by the Indian store owners. Yes, that is exactly how it works. Oh, my nuts. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, so I think we already talked a little bit about for bunny watch out from the about the over inundation of absorbing and buying everything you need to have that balanced with the doing yes because if you consume all of your creative energy watching videos reading blogs and then have none left to actually paint because could you see that happening because you see like someone like actually like like almost tiring themselves out kind of almost feeling like they're engaging in the hobby by yep. watching content, reading content. And then when they get home, like I, I did my job, you know, like right. mentally, like it- I checked off this box and now I can watch TV. It's like maybe save, like maybe like stop halfway through that process intentionally and like save some of that unbridled energy for when you get back home to your hobby desk so you can actually spend it on actually painting. Yeah. Or when you get back there, you're not cross-eyed from over inundation of information that just paralyzes you from actually doing. And then it takes you three months to finish one model when you should be putting in those reps and not try to do it all. Mm. Be more, you know, present in your painting to learn from yourself and then 
make sure you're you're referencing the things that you've been watching or absorbing. But if you're not paying attention to what you're doing, if you're so focused on all these things you've you've consumed um, and products you've bought, um, you're actually doing yourself a disservice for um, for improving or, or getting where you're so excited to where you have all the energy to. Mm-hmm. All right, what's the next one, Scott? Next up is Chip, which seems like an evolution of Bunny. Could uh, be, yeah. Has a strong desire to improve, actively seeks out and tries new techniques. This can lead to frustration when things don't work out quickly enough. Often speaks of plateaus in painting. Has seen that short Ooh, has seen that improvement in a short or long amount of time, and that fuels them to continue. Lack of improvement in their own eyes is the biggest trap for a chip, right? Like, okay, they see themselves as transitionary. Like, they're, like, on the way to mm-hmm. hobby greatness, and it's all about just, like, hitting that next thing, trying that new thing. Like, each technique is, like, a mountain to conquer, right? Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's... I. I think of this entire thing that I wrote up, the sentence that makes me the happiest and most proud is this short sentence. Often speaks of plateaus in painting. <laughs> Why? Why does it make you so happy? Because how often do you hear people talk about that? All, all the time. All the fucking time. Yeah, I hit a plateau. What do I need to do to get past this? That's a chip. <laughs> yeah, that's a chip. That's a chip. And that's not a bad thing. But And I think probably our biggest demographic of listeners are chips. You think so? Yeah. I think I think we got a lot of bunnies too. Um you know, and we probably got some stonies. Yeah, but I think there's a lot of chips and a lot I of think chips. the chips are the loudest portion. Yeah. Chips are often those wonderful um uh, people that are on our individual Patreons that back us there. Yeah, they, they want they that engage. interaction. Yeah, they engage, they comment, they they write in Discord. They want to get better. They ask for CNC. They post on Reddit, stuff like this. Yep. Yep. And so they're they're Going through all the motions, which are, this is a good thing, taking action in working on that improvement, right? So whereas a bunny is not f- focusing on a specific thing and trying to get better at that and looking at improvement as a goal, a bunny is more at just deer in the headlights. There's so many cool things and I have my excitement is fueling me. The excitement isn't so much fueling chip. The drive is fueling chip. The drive to improve. The drive, yes, 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 absolutely. Um, so that that's the big differentiators between a bunny and a chip. Yeah, they see an end goal like in a painter that they admire and the style that they paint in, and they are trying to achieve that end goal, and they're mm-hmm. trying to break down the process into logical steps that they that they are trying to like figure out. And it's like, I'm going to figure out how to do NMM. I'm going to figure out how to do skin tone. I'm going to figure out how to do like uh, sheer fabric. I'm going to figure out how to do like all, all these. These are these OSL. So, OSL. Yeah. Like uber, uber specific things. Yeah, I know. Have you ever seen like, uh, there was one I saw that was like, how do I paint a moonlight reflection on a sheer satin dress with pale skin underneath it? I'm like. Motherfucker, why are you asking the most specific fucking thing in the face of the earth? Dude, it reminds me so much of when I was first getting into videography and I had a list of camera gear that I had like made that I couldn't afford to buy yet. And I was like, this is this is the kit that I'm thinking of buying. Like I want to do this kind of videography oh, and Big all giant ass posts on a fucking message board a forum <laughs> yeah it's called D, it's called dvx user if anyone knows that one and all the actual pros are like you're a fucking idiot like you you, you just need to do the damn thing first yeah. and then you'll figure out what you want and what you need for what you like to do and it's just like i feel like such an idiot when i made that post really? but yeah it's like the, yeah kind of asking the wrong questions when you're asking questions like that i feel like or like or maybe you're just trying things that are way too complicated and are like i remember yesterday uh, or a couple days ago one of my mods was like, I was thinking of painting uh, a model with a red light, a yellow light, and a blue light uh, positioned around the model in a triangular formation, like a, an equilateral triangle. And if you think about this, this is an, a wildly complicated paint job because when red and uh, like blue interact or when green and blue interact, they form a whole new color because <laughs> paint or because color light is additive but our paint is subtractive and so you have to you have to know how to paint that and how to blend that and that'd be so fucking hard uh and i was just like holy shit i don't even want to think about that it makes my brain hurt yeah. um but uh but yeah that's funny yeah chip often has 
these very grandiose ideas, yeah, big aspirations, and which is good, um, as long as you 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 try it and you learn from it mm-hmm. instead of just doing all this. I think Chip of our profile so far, Chip is most likely of all of them to paint more. I think Chip is most likely to put the most hours in mm-hmm. in painting for what we've seen thus far. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I was absolutely a chip at some point. Like, I think I see this very natural progression of like, you are enthusiastic, you're a bunny, and then you become a chip, and then you hate the hobby, and, but then you're actually good at it. So, right. Well, where's that profile? Is that in here somewhere? Yeah, I, I think mm, <laughs> maybe it could fit in. I mean, I think chip, is, chip also has a, it feels like there's a lot more fleshing out or that could be added or, or things with chip also i think it's it's probably one of the larger boxes in terms of where you could fall maybe there's two maybe it needs to be separated but i, I feel like having less boxes is easier um mm-hmm. but um i think the biggest thing that chip needs to w- watch out for is your own frustration in execution yeah you are your drive to improve is is kind of your fuel and when you feel like that's not happening that's why getting talks of plateaus happen so often it's because they feel they're not improving and you get your jet boosters as a chip when you start often transitioning from a bunny into a chip when you're seeing improvement yeah when you're like painting an nmm model and you like make a brush stroke and you're like holy shit that looks like metal from this point of view. Like you kind of feel that energy. Yeah. Um, and that's a really important thing to motivate them for sure. Yeah. And that if, when you feel like it's not there anymore, you are at risk as a chip of just stopping painting mm-hmm. that I think most times um, people leave the hobby that are like into the painting side um, from the profile of a chip because they are the most at risk to kind of, self implode because they're not seeing what they they saw for the last six months or a year i saw all this and now it's nothing for the last three and it looks like garbage or i don't even know where to begin or what to do next or blah 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 um chip should seek outside um references outside i thought you're gonna help. say outside help like yes like they need a psychiatrist or something like that yeah maybe <laughs> and, and maybe that is where you know you're, you're you're joining a patreon for feedback you get a group of like-minded painters that you help each other out um, you give feedback. You, there's a thing that they do well and you want help and you ask for help. They go take more painting classes. I think the majority of people that take in-person painting classes are chips. Yeah. A hundred, you know? Absolutely. Yep. So you, you advantage, take a, a good, get a good advantage from that, especially some of these, the more specific the painting class is, or it's like intro to miniature painting is not for a chip. That's usually for a stony or for a bunny, mm-hmm. but as you get more specific, it's like freehanding, how to paint faces. Yeah, and you'll notice if you look at the painting ca- classes offered at any of conventions or any of these places that offer them, the vast majority of them are very specific things for two reasons. One, you can only cover so much in X amount of hours of time, so you want to make sure that that time is is well used. So you often will focus on one thing or two things and two your number one clientele is chip those are the people that will pay three hundred dollars for a four-hour class to learn how to do nmm gold yeah it's really valuable to them yes and so if you want to sell out your classes (laughs) you need to tailor more of them to chip Mm. And yeah. also, Chip has this funny toxic trait that we're gonna poke fun at a little bit. Mm. Uh, we'll call, we'll call it a, call it a subcategory. Yeah, they're they're a bit of a groupie. Mm. Uh, they love name dropping uh, pro painters, and they love to, you know, kind of like pretend like they have a personal relationship with people they take classes from. Uh, and so they'll like they'll they'll justify a lot of decisions they make through the lens of someone they admire. They'll be like, I'm going to do this because Sergio Calvarubio does this. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z because this person does this. And it's like, it's always like, you know, 
And not not all chips are like this. No, but a, not at all. A lot of them like to attach themselves to uh, to big painting personalities. It, we talked about this the 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 groupie, which is a kind of a negative term that I, I, not necessarily to associate with that, but is that that is like a it's its own profile in and of itself, but it's not necessarily connected to painting. But that kind of sub genre is often found in the chip. Yeah, yeah, right, and. Where I say, if you if if you take classes and you feel like, oh gosh, they're talking about me. I, I talk about Eric Swinson because I took his class and I mentioned it to other people and blah blah blah. It's like they don't feel bad about that. Yeah. The only thing to be really careful of, um, if you are have that groupy kind of tendency, is do not justify the way you painted a thing by name dropping when somebody is trying to help you in giving a critique, a criticism when you asked for it. I've seen this with that subgroup where they say, yeah, but that's how Angel Geraldes does it. And, but Angel's doesn't look like yours. Yeah. <laughs> so you can, you can say, and you want to learn and you want to improve and, and, and you took a class or you're on their Patreon or you're a big fan of theirs and, and you know how they paint a certain way, a certain thing. Separate that from having an objective view and a person's opinions and trying to help you improve in maybe the technical execution. Yeah. And that's just, that's the, the thing to be careful of. Yeah. And also related to this, chips often are, have not developed like a personal style yet. Yeah. And so one huge thing you do when you're like really figuring things out is you just copy a bunch of people. Um, and then through doing that, you develop a personal style because you figure out the kinds of models you like to paint, the ways you like to paint, the colors you like to use, like all these kinds of things. And so it's uh, it makes a lot of sense to attach your personality to someone else's because you're just copying them because that's how you learn in the beginning. Yeah. And that's why I think the, the chip kind of groupy thing often are kind of go hand in hand because you develop almost a a virtual relationship with someone from having watched all their content oh yeah, oh, yeah. or be subscribing to their patreon and, and you watch all of their or you read all of their pdf breakdowns of, of what they painted and you watch their videos their their long ass series of each thing that they painted and so you feel a connection to them mm -hmm. and yeah. that can often detract from you know, you just kind of going with developing your own style and you, sh that doesn't mean a chip's supposed to. I also don't, I, I have never been one that has tried to develop my own style. I still don't yeah, know yeah. if I have a style. Don't feel like that's something you're supposed to do. I think that will happen organically and copying yes. is really good. It's important because you're copying someone that's really good at something means that they're efficient at it and they've gotten really good at it. Yeah. And if you want to learn that and then adapt it later to what works better for you you still need to start somewhere and that's a good thing right yeah absolutely okay so that's chip which is i think one of our biggest ones i think that you and i were both chips maybe still are chips in some ways for sure um and so like i mean i just tried out this new thing called comic book style you know it's yeah. like it's a it's it's like it's a mountain to climb right like you want to be able to say that you have uh, accomplished all these things, tried all these things and see improvement. And I was very proud when I looked at the outcome of a uh, paint shop. So absolutely. Yeah. And I think oftentimes um, in our last category, if you're in that last category, um, you will pop back and forth from an ace to a chip. Right. So here's the last one is ace, right? What is an ace, John? Ace, they have had some acclaim for their work, whether it's placing in a competition or through acc accolades online or through social media, people look up to them. That drives them to continue to grow slash stress <laughs> over the pressure and learn from others that they look up to, whether that list is short or long. Oftentimes, painting is connected deeply to Ace's identity as a person. I think yeah. that last sentence is probably the most important for an ace. I know a lot of aces. Yeah. <laughs> is that it's, it's a part of you. Um, miniature painting isn't just a thing you do. It's not a hobby. It is a part of, it is a part of you as a, as a human being. When someone asks, what do you do? You don't answer with, Oh, I, I work at, uh, at uh, Mayo clinic. You say, I'm a fucking mini painter. 
paint those little fucking men's. Uh, but um, yeah. So the Ace is a big spectrum, and I, I purposely I purposely made it that way. I didn't want to put like. Um, the last one is like God tier. Yeah, like this is where Kirill Katayev lives in Mikhail Posarsky. It's yeah. like you'll never get here, dude. That would be like, um, that dude. I almost want to have a, a God tier just so we can name it Highlander, <laughs> 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 because there's they can only be. Well, I'd say there's there's more than one, but it, it infers it's funny. It's it infers funny. that it, it's it is exclusive. a very exclusive. Yeah, list, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Funny. That uh, there's one more. It's called Highlander. <laughs> <laughs> But I think Highlanders would, in a lot of ways, that they're still an ace. Sure. Right? Yeah, so yeah. they have accolades for what they've done. But their accolades are just fucking huge. Yeah. Right? Um, and they have a, often have a following, whether it's a following of a couple thousand of really passionate chips mm. that know their work, even though maybe they don't have a big social media presence, maybe they don't have a YouTube channel, maybe they don't have a Patreon, but they just fucking win. Mm -hmm. All they do is win, 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 no win. matter what. And and yeah. they have products they sell, whether it's a digital product as in a Patreon campaign or a physical product, like a book that they do through another company, like AK Interactive and like with like stuff like that. And so they often have things that you can like actually like buy and learn from. Mm -hmm. And any goody pee pee this is not to say that you have to be like a, a fucking mini painting celebrity or an influencer to be an ace no. anybody out there if you just listen to us and you literally don't go on the internet other than that can be an ace yeah because it isn't intrinsically tied to a following it's tied to having some success having some level of mastery right you may not be a black belt but you're no longer you're you're quite a bit removed from a purple belt. I think that's a low one. Fuck, I don't know. Um, is, is brown belt the one below black belt? I think so. Okay. Yeah, maybe like you're you're removed far enough from a white belt. I think a white belt's in the middle. Mm. Yellow Wait, belt. I, thought, I, I think white is the very first belt you get. I thought it was yellow. Okay, maybe not. We don't fucking. We're, know. Let's talk more about belts. <laughs> <laughs> um, but another big thing with with Ace, and I think. In some ways, you and I are, are are aces, and I think this holds true. There was a bit of me thinking of myself in this, where I say, the the drive to su continue to grow and succeed is important to them, but they also have the flip side of that coin, which is the stress and the pressure. Yeah. Because up until this point, there are people that are from every profile that have some level of stress or something that frustrates them or something that they dislike about the hobby. But this is the only category where you feel the pressure to succeed, to improve, to continue to get accolades, to continue to be relevant, to continue to be in the conversation of good painters, whether that's good painters in your community, whether that's good painters in your local area, whether that's good painters in the world, that there's a stress level with ACE. Relevant. Know? It's a deep word. Yeah. I think the thing is that, that is interesting about this is that when people label you as a good painter, there is an expectation that everything you produce is good and that you also know how to do everything. And so it's like when I put out a display model that I paint, that I spent 40 hours on it looks good and i feel really bad posting baylor black tide that i spent two hours on on yeah. instagram because he does not look amazing you know some people of course people, people think it looks awesome but by comparison it does not look awesome um and so there is shame and pressure in like trying to like maintain this image that everything you do is golden, right? And that you you know how to do everything and like you're not going to show off the things where it's like stepping stones for you because you have this uh you have this image about you you're trying to maintain or like maybe it's imaginary, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, lots of pressure for sure. I think that um that pressure that everything you do must be amazing um feeds into something that's kind of a subcategory that you brought up which was which would be the grinder which is <laughs> the person that paints very very few models a year maybe one yeah you got the chris clayton's you got the albert moreto font you have slayer uh, sword winner slayer albert. sword winner yeah um that they paint very very few things but everything is painted to such an immense level yeah just flawless pieces that everything you see they've painted it looks surreal that a person could do that 
Um, but uh, they don't paint many things. Yeah, Maxime Panaud, the the guy who painted the the Nurgle Marine, who he uh, scratch built, yeah. who definitely would have won the Slayer Sword if uh, Albert probably wasn't there. Yes, uh, which man, that feels so bad, yeah. kind of, um, because they were both just monumental efforts. Yes. Um, yeah, those those guys, th- those are the kinds of guys that you like. I don't know if this is true for you, but I, I want to be that guy, but I don't think I can be that guy. Like I will, I, I don't think I have the creative stamina to do that. I, well, you have to have a fair amount of stars aligning in your life for that to be able to be you. I don't and think it, so. Well, okay. Uh, no, I guess you're right. You're right. Yeah, you can't be that guy and make content. No, you can't, but you can just have a normal job yes. and paint like that. Yes. But the thing is you also need to, be amazing at miniature painting. Yeah, so you so got the other star, right? Right. Yeah, that's kind of the big one. Yeah, that's the biggest one. Yeah, it's very hard to be that guy and work uh or girl and work a full time job and have three kids running around at home. Yeah, and having a a wife and a family or a husband or a partner or whatever and all the responsibilities of everything else and still be this fucking master and to be able to put all that in. Now maybe. If that is your life and you are good at painting or you want to be really good at painting, um, maybe that's the way to do it because you can just like slowly chipping away at that rock, little ting by little ting every night. But the problem is I don't think any person, whether you're a chip, whether you're an – or well, maybe if you're an ace, but if you're anywhere else on these profiles, you're a chip, you're a bunny, you're a stony, whomever, I don't think you should emulate that. That will not lead to success for you of painting one to three models a year because you are not at the skill level yet for you to be able to execute at a high enough level for you to improve. You need to paint more models and you need to paint them faster because you need to go through the whole process, start to finish more times. And each time you do that, each of those steps, you'll become more efficient with the same amount of time. You'll understand how taking extra time here will lead to a better result. You'll understand that this step doesn't need to be done at all or it needs to be done in a different way, but that requires repetitions. Only when you've reached fucking Highlander status are you able to say, I am going to paint this model this year. Unless you're Vincent Hunan and you won the 2004 Canadian Slayer Sword with like one of your very first models because you just painted it and you painted it over and over and over and over again until it was amazing. And in, in many ways, he, he painted many models. Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> he painted the same model so many times that he knew it without even his eyes open. Yeah. Is that the, the corn yeah. rider one? Yeah. Magma Tracks, I believe was the name. Magma Tracks. It's been... The, the diorama has been referenced, I think, two times now by painters in our current era um, that they have redone it in like a new style. Um, but yeah, very cool. It's cool. Cool piece of history. So let's wrap this up a little bow. So we have our six categories. Chad, Red, Stony, Bunny, Chip, and Ace. Is that more than six? No, that's six. I thought it was six and Ace. So this is the start of the conversation. And it would be really cool if in like three months, six months, 12 months, 18 months from now, through the evolution of conversations of this in the Facebook group, or if you're watching this on YouTube, down in the comments section, to evolve, to add in, to redefine some aspects of these six um, and or remove one or add one or whatever to see where this goes. And more importantly, by this becoming something in the in the atmosphere, the what value does it have? How can it help us? Because that was a thing that I've been thinking up when when making this, but I didn't think we would actually maybe get to that point until we sat down here and recorded it and we kind of talked through it. And I don't think we hit all the points of value of defining um, these categories, but I do think we started the ball rolling. Yeah. So let us know. And uh, if we want to revisit this, if that's something we should do some more work in, and maybe we ask, uh, bring in little Vincey V, and I think his brain would be right up this fucking mm. alley. I purposely did not contact him last night about this because I was going to, but I'm like, no, you are going to taint my thoughts, Vince, <laughs> and then when I have this whole list with your help, it's not going to be mine anymore, and I'm not going to like it. Yeah, I'm going to disagree with our own fucking thing. <laughs> it, was good, it was a good list, though. It was a good list. I love the descriptions. They are well written. Oh, thank you. Okay, let's talk about some newsy news, Scott. Mm. 
Mm-mm-mm-mm. Uh, we mentioned it a little bit ago on the main topic, but congratulations to Alberto Moreto Font for winning the Slayer Sword at Warhammer Fest with his King of Lumineth miniature. This is his second Slayer Sword after his 2006 win with the Black Orc War Boss. Oh, nice. Okay, I actually didn't know that little bit of history. Um, what do I do? I know this mini Black Orc War Boss. You will recognize it. So. Oh no, the website is total jank. Oh, you done got jank done. Okay. So this is King of Lumineth is really weird because it feels like an old fantasy elf. It is. And he just like added some slightly Lumineth bits to it so it'd fall within the lore and not get disqualified. Yeah, I, I don't know like exactly the conversions that happen, but the main model itself is definitely like an old pewter fantasy figure. Yeah. But like it looks great. It looks this, so good. <laughs> I think one of the things that he does so incredibly well is creates such elegant composition in the piece outside of just the model. It's like it everything about that feels like you're in a snapshot of someplace in the Warhammer world. Yeah. And that, in addition to it being just so incredibly well executed. I think that's also a huge thing for me. Because, like, I'm at a place in my painting career where I don't often feel like I look at a thing and think to myself, okay, given infinite time, I could achieve that. You know? When I look at that, when I look at the way that Albert paints, I have no fucking clue. I have no clue how it looks the way it looks. It has this soft quality to it. That I don't know how it works, and I like I don't think I could figure it out if given infinite time. Um, so I think there's just a, there's, there's a magic to it, and it's like you know the moment you see one of his pieces, they all have this feel. Um, it's like it's all, everything is put through like some Instagram filter. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Just everything is like just slightly. I don't say fuzzy because it's not like a fuzzy. It's like everything is just like like a haze over it. That yeah, the paint job is just kind of like a haze. Yeah. It is. It's. It's kind of mind-boggling. It is. I bet if you saw how he did it, and you're like, I want to do this 10-minute video. He's gonna run through this 10-minute video, but his ma took a year to paint. Yeah, well, just like painting one surface. Right? Okay, sure, sure. How he does the skin on the forehead or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You'd know. You'd be like, okay, I get that. Maybe, but maybe. Then it would be a matter of execution, which is another thing, and fucking patience. Yeah, dude. <sighs> fucking patience. All we need is a little patience. Uh, what's what's next? You got some? You got some? 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 We got the Broken Anvil Kickstarter now live on Kickstarter for their new uh, studio paint set that was developed by their new studio painter whose name at the moment escapes me. What's his I name? I can't remember. Hold on, I'm gonna figure it out real quick. Cor- we, we can't do this guy dirty. Cordero. Yeah, his name is Daryl. Kenneth. Was <laughs> <laughs> uh, his name Josh? Uh, no, that's not it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> It sounds right. <laughs> okay. Josh Brown. But yeah, John and I were both sent this uh, this paint set um, to uh, to try out prematurely. And they also his name is Josh Davis. Um, so close. And they, oh, look at that. There's a, there's a, there's a picture of a painted. Um, penis? No, not a penis. <laughs> oh, it's not live on Kickstarter. It's, uh, well, at least right now it isn't. It is May, uh, May 10th. So it should be by the time this. It is. Okay, right. Um, it's a it's a GW figure that Blood Angel guy Sang- Sanguinius Dante whatever Sanguin I think it's Dante but yeah their their range is out a lot of beautiful colors um, give a very slight review I love the way the paint range is organized uh, in these like sets of five paints I love the warm white warm black cold black cold white white additive black additive idea they had um, I just love it when things are logically laid out it just helped my brain so much. Did I tell you, and I know this is meant to be the additives, the black additive and white additive, that they are meant to be mixed, obviously, because they have the word additive in there. You're supposed to mix them into something. Um, If you use the black one straight, it is the glossiest paint I've ever used in my life. Really? It. I had to, I use it on the sword for the, the orc, and I had to matte varnish once I was done with just that part, just that sword, because <laughs> it was so terribly distracting. And I'm like, oops, I didn't use it how I'm supposed to use it. <laughs> um, and it's supposed to be that way, right? So black additive, when you add some some shine to it, it makes it deeper. Right? Mm, okay. Yeah, so it's how it, make it to, makes it a deeper color. That's why a matte black looks more like gray and a... And a uh, shiny black or glossy black looks darker. Would it be suitable for painting base rooms? 
or the it's tube. too shiny for that, dude. It's when I shiny. when I say it's shiny, it's like take a bad and black and crank it up to eleven. Oh my gosh, it is the shiniest thing I've ever painted with. Okay, it's to a point where it actually doesn't apply to the model super easily either yeah. because it's so glossy. Yeah, and I, I realized after I did, I'm like. I'm not using this right, <laughs> which is, that's m my bad, y'all, my bad. I probably should have mixed in a little bit into either the warm black or the cold black, and that would have been perfect. Yeah. But I'm a dumbass. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, to, like, balance the review a little bit with some, also a little bit of negative, I'm not a huge fan of the dropper bottles they went for. I don't know why the capes, the caps are safety caps. Uh, the, the nib is so tiny and thin, it gets clogged super easily, and it's very difficult to take the nib off of the bottle, like, more so than a normal dropper bottle. Um, and also the paints are pre-diluted, which is uh, not my preference. It's not a bad thing, but I prefer thick paints. Uh, but I painted the entirety of that Nico Galaxy figure with the range, and so you can obviously achieve great things with them. Yeah, I also really like the way that the set was um, was designed. I like that it's 40 colors. I talked about this in, when I, I did my video uh, about it, um, that it f every color feels like it has a purpose. There's not just like adding more colors because just to add more colors to the range. It felt like these are the colors we want to make. How many colors is this? Great. That's how big the yeah. range is. It doesn't feel padded out. Pat yeah, it doesn't yeah. feel padded at all. And yeah. it also doesn't feel like not nearly enough, like the Chimera range, where it's just like, I don't have enough here. I could technically mix from this whatever color, how I many 12 10 colors that's the original chimera range yeah you could technically mix probably any pretty much any color out of that but you have to do so much mixing so much here it's just like you have to do mixing for this but they all mix well but it's the kind of mixing you already naturally do which yes. is like making highlights and shadows right you're not like trying to mix to get a shade of color um yeah. well, there, like there are some gaps yeah like the teal on this is not on on her is a mix yeah and so you can get some new entirely new colors and because they are very saturated and very little to none for most of the colors, white or black paint in them, they mix together and still give you another vibrant color, which is, I think, one of the most valuable things of the set is like you're not mixing and everything gets desaturated. Like you ever you try to mix any two random GW paints together and it turns some shade of gray or brown plus <laughs> plus what the two colors were that you mix because there's so much of those in there. So, yeah. Anyway, I'll quit talking about that. <laughs> right. GW confirms that. Uh, what will be coming in the new 10th edition for 40K starter box Leviathan. 25 Marines, 47 Nids, I don't know what CRB is, and chapter approved mission decks and decals. Um, that's that's the book. CRB means book. Because oh, it does come with the hardcover. Oh, 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 core rule core book. Core rule book. We that's got there. Is, that's what it we is. We did it. Yeah, it's a big motherfucking box. It's a big box. I wonder what it's going to cost. 250 bucks. Any other questions? That is it. <laughs> uh, uh, interestingly enough, the giant ass Horus Heresy box that costs three hundred dollars. Oh shit! So it's cheaper than that. Wow. I was I did not see that coming. I just assume once they hit that mark, then like the next no turn it back. <laughs> yeah, no turn it back. But I feel like I've never seen a a, a a GW box cost in the threes. Yeah, this was it. Was that the first one? Okay, that's nuts. As yeah, because well, there's like what is 176 fucking old Space Marines in it, and then there's a tank, and then there's like two, is it one or two, um, uh, dreadnoughts like the old timey ones. Yeah, Dorito style dreadnoughts. And Doritos, going back to Doritos. Yeah, it's callback at the beginning of the episode. They're Dori <laughs> Doritos. Uh, some of these new nids look fucking cool. Yeah. Okay, I'm not a huge nid fan, but I am a fan of some of those nids. Yeah, there's new little ones that they're kind of like. They look like a little bit almost like they got some some myconid, some fungal kind of influence to them too. Oh. They, they're little, they're like little runners, but they just seem a little bit off. And I really dig that thing. I like the ones with the snappy like jaws that like have like a cover over their eyes. Oh, unhingy jaw, you man. They're called like neuro gaunt or something like that. I like those guys. Yeah, I think we might be talking about the same thing. Are we? Yeah, I think okay. we are. Okay. <laughs> So I know if there's a thing we both say we like it, I'm like, shit, are we talking about the same thing? <laughs> yeah, not, I don't know. I don't remember anything like fungal, though, with the models. Uh, maybe maybe I was just on shrooms. I, mean, <laughs> I feel like just nids in general are kind of fungal in nature. Yeah. Uh, Modifius announces a new tabletop RPG 
uh, and skirmish game called Dreams and Machines set in a dystopian world blending mechs and future tech that has fallen to ruin after a war with the machines. Okay, so it's got maybe Terminator, maybe Matrix vibes. So if you're a fan of Modiphius and these types of games, uh, RPGs or skirmish games, check them out. I, I just like saying that word, Modiphius. Modiphius, yeah. Yeah, that feels like like if there was a prequel to Matrix and you found out, you know, Morpheus learned all of this from his grandpa. What's his grandpa's name? Modiphius. For sure. <laughs> oh, cheesy. <laughs> um, Paint Pot Challenge Season 2 is now on. I don't know if you ever caught this back when it happened before, maybe years ago, where people like sculpt GW paint pots and they put them in funny scenes and stuff and they put like legs and arms and shit on them. What the fuck? No, uh, I'm not caught. Oh, there's some really good ones. There's just one where uh, there's like a zombie coming out of a Sterling mud pot. Like, okay, that's... Yeah, there's, there's all sorts of fun things. So you can check the link on that if it's something you want to uh, try out for yourself. It just it just seems like a something that a Stony would like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hundo P, dude. Uh, not that ever, other people couldn't enjoy it, too. Um, fucking Chad wouldn't, but everybody else would. Yeah. Everybody else on the list. Uh, I got to keep saying their names because the more I say it, the more like it becomes the cultural norm, and then everyone will just use these ner- these names. <laughs> I mean, you have a very good skill at <laughs> willing things into existence that aren't real things, but just are <laughs> words. Um, it's like you have it's, a, it's an incredible talent. Like my God, like my God, did Ghost Boat stick like a <laughs> motherfucker, dude? Like I cannot bring up demon shit without some fucking idiot saying ghost boat. It's just it's like what the fuck. Um, Kingdom Death announces March twenty twenty three releases, including included in which is the Monster one point six core game. All right, help me out. What the fuck does this mean? I don't even know. What does this mean? Have you gotten your your backer? I don't have everything yet. No, they still haven't gotten the stuff out for the gambler's chest and for the some other something two big final releases that are still not fulfilled from like seven years ago all right i suddenly feel better about my current kickstarter jesus christ seven years ago seven years it might be longer than that at this point it's pretty wild um yeah so there's more kingdom death shit uh next thing speed paint 2.0 2.0 by the Army Painter. The complete set is coming up for pre-order, uh, and it will release on May 27th for 379 United States dollars. <laughs> Holy shit! Did you get one of these in the mail? I did. I got one too. I got a big package. I was sitting on my doorstep. I'm like, oh, a big package. Who's this for? It says me. I pick it up. I'm like, oh god, this box is heavy. Yeah. I open it up. That thing is like, it's the size of a motherfucking suitcase. It's big it's yeah. so heavy There's and like they keep like they they, they kind of send products as they're developing them and i feel like i've gotten like three iterations of 2.0 exactly yeah. like, like three different varieties of speed paint there's so much fucking speed paint okay i'm, I'm, I'm only so fast man <laughs> so fast mantic right. mantic partners with warhol to bring armada uh to the platform warhol is a free-to-play online wargaming sim okay for ninth age fantasy battles uh, James says, I thought this was an interesting move, and I wonder if they'll move over more games. So Warhol sounds like it reminds me of Tabletop Simulator, which a lot of people who play GW games use. Mm-hmm. And also the one that I used uh, when playing Guild Ball. I can't remember what it's fucking called. It doesn't matter. Um, but it was like way ancient looking. So I wonder what this one looks like. It was kind of like new and fresh. Hmm. Warhol. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Last bit of news, unless there's something else you want to share. And that uh, in the Kickstarter corner today, is the Iron Maiden Miniatures Collection. So Iron Maiden is in the band, Iron Maiden. If you ever wanted to paint Eddie, who is like their theme mascot, zombie kind of guy, um, here's your chance. Mm. $75 per bust or 75 millimeter model. And the Kickstarter ends on May 25th with fulfillment projected for Dash. Uh, I guess we don't know when it's going to, give or take a year. <laughs> Six months to a year. This doesn't appeal to me at all, but I, uh, Simon had already released a product with 32 millimeter models of Eddie. Mm-hmm. Um, and I picked that up. Speaking of, I don't, I have no idea where I like bought it like a year ago. I don't know where it it's is. not fulfilled. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't, 
I, it's, so for me, that's fine. Like, I don't care about a 32 mil model. I don't want to paint a fucking display model of Eddie, though. Like, Iron Maiden's fine, but... Yeah. Like, well, it's weird, too, because they're... I, I don't know if it's all of them, but many of them, they're, like, from the album cover art. Yes, yes, yes. And I saw Ricardo Agostini painting one that was based like even with the, the diorama and the setting like based on the album art yeah in like the it's the insane asylum yep. one yep. where he's in the padded room yep yeah and so it's kind of like well, this to me i'm like well that's a fucking comic book i see that thing and i i envision the album cover because i fucking love iron maiden they're awesome but i just don't have any interest in me doing the thing that already exists i'm like that artwork it exists in the world i think it's cool i don't need to own my own 3d version but People like it, and if people buy it, that's awesome because it is officially licensed. So I think that's a cool thing, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah, that that is a cool thing. Welcome to the end of the podcast. That was weak. Welcome to the end of the podcast. Thank you for making it over the end. We did it. We uh, made it. I didn't think this was going to be a long one, but I was foolish for thinking so. Every single episode we do is a long one. I know. And I got here late today because I had to take my daughter to the bus stop. So I was here like an over an hour later, and so. We're well over an hour past usual num num times. Yeah, and also we're we're missing the Dan now. Dan is not going to be able to eat with us because he had to go to work at. Oh one. yeah, that that messes with things. We're playing flesh and blood afterwards. So who cares about Dan? Fuck you! <laughs> if you guys enjoy the podcast and you want to support it, there are a number of ways that you can do it, both free and not free. Uh, some free ways are you can uh, whitelist our channel on YouTube to watch ads. We play ads every thirty minutes. That's uh, free. You can also tell your nerd friends about our podcast. Give us a review on wherever you're listening to the podcast we always appreciate that if you got some cash to spend and you want to support your favorite podcast because we absolutely are that look at these fucking thighs are you kidding me uh i give my body to this podcast uh, you can become a patron patron is a huge way to support the podcast you get access to an extended episode most notably where we talk about things like our favorite models from other painters new techniques we tried out and we also give feedback to one of our patrons and so as a patron you can submit a model for feedback and you can also supply topics for us that we might use in an episode that we credit you on uh, you can also buy merch from our Teespring store, which is linked below along with the Patreon. That'll do it, though. Wow. We did it. And in but another fortnight, we will do it again. <laughs> and until then, we will catch you on the flippity-flop. <laughs>